we're gonna upload it to YouTube for you um, to watch it later. Okay, I think you can take over the screen, right? I guess we're all set. About JavaScript Crash Course, we're running this for the third time. We did it in 2017, 2018, and this is the third iteration. We're gonna have eight weeks of lectures, and at the end, we're gonna have a graduation event. Thank you for the very easy setup here. We have um, a syllabus that is designed for you to teach you backend programming with JavaScript. So what we do is we teach you fundamentals of web programming for the backend with Node.js, which is a little bit different than what other boot camps or events are trying to do to teach front end. We thought there's a great need of backend engineers. That's why we're focusing on backend. Uh, we're going to have a lecture for the front end. Is it there already? Yeah. The seventh lecture will be on the front end. And we're, we're going to be talking about Vue.js there um, because we actually aim to create full stack engineers. And for the ones who are new, um, we have a lot of homeworks. This is an intense course. You are expected to watch and understand the videos and do the homeworks. And at the end of eight weeks, on the ninth week, we're going to celebrate your progress with a graduation event where you will demonstrate your projects, where you will come on stage, if you want, of course, and present your projects to the entire class. What happens is we have two internship positions, one here at Wayfair and one at UNU Motors. And at the end, we're going to be offering you internship positions. You know, we're going to do interviews. So you m might have a chance to get, um, hopefully it will be a full-time contract, a job at Wayfair and UNU. And actually, a couple of people did it in the past. They are with us right now. They're going to teach classes. So um, the graduates from first year class, Maria and Celia, or Celia, outside. Um, they are. They have started their careers as engineers after joining this course, and then taking up positions at UNU as interns. And then, I think they're with UNU for almost two years now, which is really great if you look at it. Um, so this thing is as real as it can get. This is not your average course. We're just offering it for free because we love giving back to the community. But this is in terms of effort that you have to put in as well, is well above average. So we had a great first week. We had a lot of submissions. And I'm very, very happy to receive all the homeworks. They were amazing. Now, some people wrote, this is the first time that I'm programming, that I'm coding. And if you actually knew, if you could have a reference how many years people spend to get to that point where you delivered the first homework, you'd be amazed. Um, because you did proper object-oriented programming after three hours of lectures. And that's really, really hard. So um, there are a couple of people here who are taking the course for the second or the third time. They can actually tell you how difficult it was um, to get to that point. So you made it. And we're super happy with the results of the homeworks. And we're going to be putting more and more on top. Today, we're going to look into Node.js and how we work with Node.js. Because from now on, we're going to be working in Node. The first lecture was in the browser. So we were using Chrome and writing JavaScript there, just to get you more familiar with the basics of JavaScript. But from now on, we're going to dive into Node.js backend, MongoDB as a database. Um, we're going to end up with deploying your applications to the cloud and scaling it on the cloud. That is, again, a feat that nobody else can do. People spend years to understand what the cloud is, how to deploy applications to the cloud, how to scale it on the cloud automatically. And you're going to have it on the eighth lecture, on the final lecture. Um, so I'm speaking with a lot of confidence because we did this twice before. This is the third time um, we created about 100 engineers out of this course. And hopefully, this number will be about 180 by the end of this, um, this iteration. OK, how does it feel? Did I bore you? Is it? OK, thank you. Um, <laughs> so the main communication will happen over Slack. Um, 
is there anybody who didn't get Node.js set up yet? Who don't have Node.js on their computers? One, two, three, maybe? OK. Um, four. So what we're going to do right now with the assistants over there, we have a lot of people, primarily from UNU, um, helping us as teaching assistants. They're going to run around. Whenever you raise your hand for help, they're going to come to your desk and work out the solution with you so that you can follow along. Okay, um, We're going to start with installing Node.js. So please, um, let's help the people who don't have Node.js on their computers, because you won't be able to go through this course, this lecture, without Node.js. Raise your hands, and an assistant will come over. If you don't have Node.js on your computer, they will come over and help. What we did was we released a welcome guide, an onboarding guide, and where we detail how to set up all of these things. and further MongoDB as well. So you're expected to go through them. Oh, yeah, it's here. <laughs> you will also need Visual Studio Code. Do you have a question? So the question is, which version of Node are we using, and is it important? Um, it is kind of important. We try to use the latest version. It's 0 0.12 something. Um, as long as it's, yeah, is it none? Is it okay? I don't know. Okay, but 13 are they're not stable releases, so no, the, the odd numbers are not stable. Um, so we use 12.13.13. Um, just download that one. If you have an older version, that's also probably fine as long as it's not from 10 years ago. And I hope you wouldn't be here if you had installed Node.js 10 years ago. <laughs> it's fine. I'm just joking. Um, we can upgrade them as well. Um, OK. Slack. Join Slack. We are discussing everything on our channel. You're submitting your homeworks. Again, there is weekly homeworks that you have to do um, to finish the course. And I cannot underline enough the importance of Slack. You need a GitHub account to submit your homeworks. It's all mentioned in the welcome guide. You can find it on Slack. Um, it's pinned as a message. If you go to the pinned messages, you'll be able to find it. Um, so we expect you to install Node.js and Visual Studio Code to be able to program today. Oh, yeah, that bit is important. If you, for some reason, for any reason, if you cannot really follow what's going on on the screen, that's fine. You just need to focus on understanding as much as you can, um, because we're going to provide the recordings afterwards anyway. So it's not going away. Um, you can always come back, watch it multiple times, stop it whenever you want to go over the exercises and, and implement them at your own pace. So you don't have to type along. However, I would suggest you to try. So try following the instructor doing and typing whatever they're typing, because that will result in some muscle memory that is really hard to get outside. Um, if you have any questions, at any point, raise a hand and ask. There are no, there are, um, no stupid questions. There are no dumb questions. All the questions are valid. There are no long questions. There are no unrelated questions. Feel free to ask anything. Um, the instructor will guide you if the question should be discussed outside the class or if you're taking too long. So don't worry about it. We're in charge. This has never happened before. There is never enough questions to freak out people. So don't worry about it. Just ask. Whenever you raise a hand, um, a teaching assistant will try to support you and come and help. And that's our way of keeping the balance. Obviously, we should be careful about keeping it quiet, because we're, we are we had 20 tables, so we are, I guess, about 80 people, or maybe a little bit more. So it's a little bit difficult here. Just try to make sure uh, to keep the, the loudness down. OK, we're actually five minutes into the lecture. And I think now it's time for me to introduce today's instructor. Because every week, we're going to have a different instructor to give the course. Obviously, we're all trained in doing this. We have a lot of um, previous material to cover. 
So the content will not change. But it's really important for you to get um, perspectives from different people, different instructors, and different views on programming. And we also try to be very active on, on Slack for code reviews. So submit early, get multiple, get feedback from multiple people. That is the best way to approach this. Now, today's speaker, today's instructor is a very special person. He is not only one of the best software engineers I've ever seen in my life, and I have seen quite a lot. I've been doing this for a very long time. He's one of the best. He is also literally my best friend. We have been working together for more than 15 years. And we were to working together at Uno Motors before. Um, and now he is the director of software engineering at Uno Motors. Has a great team of engineers doing crazy things. So if you are into programming or engineering, I would recommend you to check out their positions. Um, he's also a great mentor towards junior engineers, um, generally an awesome person. And I really like listening lectures from him. And this is going to be the next one today about Node.js. So please give a warm welcome and applause to Mert. Obviously, we were too excited and didn't set up the microphone. Mm -hmm. Like this? Yeah. Wow. It's good. I feel famous. All right, then. Thank you very much for the introduction, Arman. It's an honor to be here. And I wish that you could see yourself from here. It's just, you're so amazing that it's just, it's just worth, it makes it all, worth all the effort to, to be here, to, to prepare, to, to come here and to teach classes. It's just the energy in the room is so, so good. I um, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming here. It's just, it's, it's probably out of your comfort zones for most of you, but this is, this, this is where improvement starts. This is where success starts. You need to go out of your comfort zone to once in a while to, to just try new things and achieve new things. It's just, amazing that you're here and before starting i would like you to be very proud of yourselves and um, give yourselves a, uh, an applause please right now hey today we're going to dive into the beautiful and mysterious world of backend engineering but before we go there i would like us to remind ourselves the difference between the back and engineering and the front end engineering um, can anyone raise their hands and tell me what's the difference what is back end what is front end please yes. thank you so uh, front end contains uh, css html and whatever happens in the and the website that the user can see mm -hmm. when the user try to um, and, um, uh, import some some data or so or just uh, fill a form uh, when this website tries to connect to the database it goes to the back end so okay so happened. the database is the back end um, for me it sounds like it yeah part of it definitely yeah. yes and the front end is Okay. Everything that's related to HTML, CSS, exactly. whatever you see. Yeah. Anyone else? I have a microphone, but you don't have to speak into a microphone. Uh, I would give uh, the definition that um, backend and frontend correspond to paradigm of client-server architecture. Whoa. So. Um, Server uh, implies the connection to data storage. So, but all the calculation could be distributed between front end and back end. Okay, wow. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very splendid and. Okay, I heard the word server. What is a server? Can anyone raise their hands and tell me what is a server? Yes. Survey basically is a computer uh, that um, um, 
provide any kind of services to other other kind of com other computers or clients that's great where is that server for example google.com where is it is it on your computer no the server in, uh, for google it's like a they have different databases everywhere okay. all around the globe so yes as far as we know google has 2.5 million servers all around the world distributed around 20 different data centers and there is a really nice sticker that i love there is no cloud it's just someone else's computer it's just cloud is somewhere it is it, it is actually servers rack of servers rooms of servers buildings of servers somewhere owned by google in this case google serves their website and all of their services like maps and everything else from their their service but any computer can be can behave like a server we like in in the next lectures in two lectures i guess we're going to turn our computers into a web server now we're going to write some backend code it's going to run on our computers but in a few weeks we're going to be able to access each other's web servers by through the internet and then in the future we're going to deploy it onto the cloud on technically someone else's computer and then we will be able to shut our computers down and then still we'll be able to access all of the all of the content all of the information uh, that will be stored on uh, somewhere else in the cloud. So yeah, the backend is everything that is behind the user's touch. It is the servers, it is the databases, all of the infrastructure that serves all of the data into the front end, where the front end starts with the user interaction. It is where the users interact, users see, users touch, their mobile applications, their desktop applications, everything that runs on the client's uh, client side is the front-end code and everything else that serves that data serves that information to the client is the back-end side of things and as this lecture series is focused is javascript we're going to be using the companion of javascript on the back-end side which is node.js could you please raise your hands and tell me what is Node.js? Is it like a new language? Is it different than JavaScript? What is it? Runtime. A runtime environment. Okay. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Anyone wants to add anything else? No? All right then. I can give a, a brief description from Wikipedia. Node.js is an open source cross-platform JavaScript runtime environment that executes JavaScript code outside of a browser. Very technical term. But it, it was invented in 2009, so we are technically celebrating 10th anniversary of Node.js. It's been quite a while, it's been quite a ride. And let's, let's focus on every word that I pronounced just a minute ago. So Node.js is open source. What is open source? Can anyone tell me what open source is? Not you. <laughs> and if don't be shy, there is no wrong answers. Yes, please. We're free to join. Yes, we're free to join and uh, free to stop contributing. That is amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, open source implies that it's written by us not specifically us, but by the community, by ourselves. It is someone else, a mortal human being that wrote the code and made it publicly available online. Every line of code, you can read it, uh, you can find it online, you can read it, you can learn about it. It is like Node.js is one of those projects. It is open source, you can see every line of code online. It's not like chaos, like not everyone pushes code. Of course, there is some system behind it. There is a, there is a board that uh, decides what is being built next, what, what comes next, but you can be one of the members of that board. That is an open community. That's what makes Node.js so beautiful. The second keyword was cross-platform. Do you know what cross-platform means? What does it sound like to you? Anyone can raise their hands and tell me? Yes, please. Well, what is a platform? The answer is, uh, it can run on multiple platforms that's absolutely correct but what what does a platform mean
That is perfect. Thank you very much for both of you. Yes, it means that it can run on different architectures. In this case, Linux, Macintosh, Windows are different architectures, but it's not limited to that. There are a lot of other devices in the world, mostly IoT devices, little Arduino devices. It can, Node.js can run in multiple, many different architectures, including the light bulbs in your home. So that's what makes Node.js so beautiful. It can run everywhere in the smallest of microprocessors. It just makes it so much accessible and learning JavaScript is the perfect way to, 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 to be, to, to, to touch that world. You know, like, you know, if you, if you know JavaScript, then you, it means that you can write code on the front end, you can write code on the back end, and it means that it, you can run code even in your light bulbs. That just makes it so beautiful. It is 10 years, like, like if, back in the day, this was like a dream. People, like JavaScript was confined only in the front end environment. You, you, if you know JavaScript, then you wrote code on, for the client side. For the back end, you had to learn a new language. There's, there, there was no other way. You had to learn either like PHP, Ruby, C++, uh, .NET, whatever. You, you needed to learn something like that. But now JavaScript bridges that gap between the front end and back end development. It just, it just breaks down all the walls. And it's just, it's, it's just the perfect language to get started on the programming. And you are doing it right now. And you should be proud of yourself. It's amazing. So the next keyword is runtime environment what is a runtime environment it was your answer i guess okay kind of build the environment for uh, running javascript so node.js is javascript mm -hmm. for running the environment for the server side okay yeah, I, I could go a little bit deeper. Thank you very much for your answer. Runtime environment means that you don't need to do anything beforehand to be able to run your code. You don't need to prepare your code. It's just, there is, it means that there's another software that takes your code as plain text, as JavaScript plain text, as an input. It understands it, interprets it, and then outputs it and then outputs it as a machine code, machine language. Like if you remember, Arman was telling about the ones and zeros and the, the machines understand some form of language, but programming languages are for us to understand. And runtime environments take that JavaScript plain text file as an input and then outputs as a machine language. And it does it in real time. That's the beauty of it. You don't need to compile. This is a technical keyword that you some languages Take some for some languages you need to prepare your code beforehand before you run it, like exe files in Windows languages. If, if you open that file up, it's just gibberish, just ones and zeros. You have no, you don't understand. But for JavaScript, you just open the JavaScript file and you can read it and you can understand it. This is what makes it beautiful. And and more technically, um, Node.js is is based on Google's Chrome browser. It's open source version, Chromium. And if you if you take that and then and then tear away everything that is related to the UI, visual things, and everything, if you just go into the very core of it, there there you will find the V8 engine. It is the engine that runs and understands the JavaScript, and Node.js is built on that. And today we're going to be delving into that world, and we're going to be using Node.js for the first time, probably for most of you. So I need to make sure that everyone has Node.js installed on their computers before moving on. So please raise your hands if you still don't have Node.js installed. We will help you. There are a lot of people here. Yes, I am. OK. Um, then we might need to go into the second part, which is the Visual Studio Code. Do you have Visual Studio Code installed as well? OK. So to be able to check whether Node.js is installed in your computer or not, please open Visual Studio Code. And you'll probably see a welcome screen that welcomes you. And up there, there is a menu called Terminal. And then there, please click on New Terminal. My computer is behaving weird. Whatever you see, please type node and then press enter. 
there's a menu called terminal, and then there's an item in the menu called new terminal. Please click on that, and then type node and press enter. In the meantime, um, you have to join the meet link oh, sure. and present your screen. Otherwise, the recording won't take your screen. That's on Slack, um, on JavaScript mm -hmm. Crash Course channel. You need to join and share and present. Yes, please. Mart. Mart. Like Matt in English, it's easy. You can call him Matt. Yeah, Matt, we Matt call him is Matt. easy. Sure. I, I'm still having a hard time hearing you, sorry. Uh, what kind of node version are you? You can... Yeah, or dash V in short can help you. As long as it's not like zero point something, it would work. Yes. <laughs> Sorry for this ordeal, I need to join the meetup uh, meeting. You should mute your computer. I should mute my computer. Uh, the here, this yeah. one. Yeah, and maybe and the, camera. Yeah, and join. Ask meeting. to join the meeting. <laughs> and present. And then them. I need to present. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Hope that works. It will work. I Does think. anybody need help? Are you all fine? Are you all set? We're going to start programming. Oh. You have to restart it. <laughs> Don't install a new operating system before coming to a lecture. No. Help needed there. Okay, no, it's it's fine. Just trying to be careful. Yay! Finally. Does it work, Herman? Yes. It's perfect. So, right, let me continue. Um, while you install Node.js and Visual Studio Code, make sure that you have Visual Studio Code in, uh, installed on your computers. But what is Visual Studio Code? Visual Studio Code is an, is an IDE, an integration, integrated development environment, which is basically a fancy notepad for us to be able to write our code in. If you remember last week, Arman was using Google Chrome uh, to execute a JavaScript code and also write the JavaScript code. Like it was in the developer console, he was writing, like clicking the snippets and then writing and then clicking run. It was an integrated solution. It was while you were writing the code and you were also uh, executing the code. Node.js is the place where we're going to execute the, the code on the backend side, but we need somewhere to write, literally write our code in. And this is where uh, the Visual Studio code comes in. It is, it is a Microsoft project, and it's indeed written, with, with written in JavaScript. So that makes it really, really interesting for us as well. This will be your primary tool of trade 
if you want to go into a software engineering, if you want to be a specific a JavaScript engineer, Visual Studio Code is the best ID that's out there. It has so many plugins. It has so many customizations. Today, we're not going to be able to go into all of those details, but I'm going to show you a few details about how we can use uh, Visual Studio Code in, into our advantage. And please, in your own time, I really recommend you to, to read about Visual Studio Code and how uh, you can improve your experience using Visual Studio Code. So the first thing that you see is going to be a welcome screen, but we're going to be um, working on code. So we need a file to, to, to write our codes in. So here, please click on um, File and Open. And there, just pick any folder that you would like to work in. Uh, and then please click on a new folder and then name it. I'm going to name it week two for this. You can just name it any anything you like. And click on week two and press open. It's going to open that empty folder for you to work in. It's really important that you don't do the new file, but please do it this way. Please click open, create a new folder, and open the folder itself. We're going to need the whole directory structures because we're going to be working in multiple files today. Um, yeah. Could you zoom in? Zoom in, maybe like this. Yeah. yeah. Even more. Yeah. Mm. So let's create our first file. Here you can see a little icon, new file, or you can just click file and new file. Uh, and then let's name it index.js. As soon as I type S, even before I press enter, you can see that the icon of the file has changed into a JavaScript icon. That is one beauty of IDEs. It's they understand what code, what language you're writing in. So when I press enter, I'm going to see that uh, a new file has been opened. And as all developers uh, do when trying new environments and new uh, languages, I'm going to write hello world. How do I write, how do I print hello world uh, in, in JavaScript? Please raise your hands and tell me. Console.log in quotation marks, hello world, even exclamation mark. Yes, that's great, but how, how do I run this? It's just the text on my screen. Um, as you remember, we have used the terminal. Please, if you haven't done so, please click on the menu item terminal and then click on new terminal. And there, make sure that, that the terminal displays the folder name that you're in. I, mine says week, week dash two, but just make sure that you are on the, in, in the folder that you want to be. Uh, for you to understand that I guess PWD is for uh, Linux and MacOS, it will just print out the full path. And for um, Windows, I think it's just CD, CD and enter. Just make sure that you're on the correct folder. It's really important. And then once we're there, I would like to run the code. And yes, Anya? Um, you can change folder both on Windows and Linux as CD and space and then name of the folder. Dot dot goes one folder back. And if you need help, just raise your hand. It's, it's going to be harder for me to explain it here. There are a lot of uh, teaching assistants, and they will help you to go into the correct folder. I'm in the correct folder. I'm going to just continue. Um, for me to be able to run this, I'm, we're going to use Node.js. And for that, node is our keyword. So node index.js, and then pressing Enter will display the hello world. Please make sure that you can see this hello world. It is really important for the rest of the lecture. Please raise your hands if you cannot see the hello world. And please, the teaching assistants, help them. For the ones who missed the first lecture, console.log is a native, it's a built-in function that allows us to print things, print statements onto the screen. So it's just prints things for us onto the screen. Console.log, it's the JavaScript version of that. We have used it here. OK, then I'm going to continue. Um, yes, please. Oh, yes, sorry. 
Uh, after you type console.log hello world, we need to save the file. Obviously, the computer needs to understand that it is the final version of it. Some Visual Studio Code configurations automatically save it, but most probably the default one does not. So please, can we please a little bit quieter? And command S saves the file, or in Windows, I think it's control S. Please make sure you save the file before executing it. All right, I'm just going to continue. I'm going to recap some of the things that Armand did last week. Uh, one of them was the, the add function, if you remember. We, we created a function that takes two parameters in, and then as a result, it summed them up and then returned. Do you remember how we did that in JavaScript? Could you please raise your hands and tell me? Just a moment. Um, the reason that there's so much chatter is that there is a problem uh, that you are, tr uh, you are setting your, uh, your environment up so that we can maybe stop and then help each other out so that we're on the same page. Or if, if, if that's not the case, please focus on the, the answers. The question was, last week we have, um, we have learned that we can create functions which takes inputs and then creates like outputs. One of them was one of such function was the addition, add function. That add function took two parameters in as number one and number two, and then it uh, returned the result of the sum of those two numbers. I'm asking how we did that in JavaScript. Yes, please. So const, maybe the name of the function? Okay, so parameters like num1 inside the parentheses, num1, num2, and there was a fat arrow, and what, what's this? Num1 plus num2. If so, anybody needs help, please raise your hands and we're going to come over. It's fine. Just, you should be running these things. You should be seeing the console log output um, for us to continue. Just let's make sure that we have the installation correctly. Just raise your hands if you couldn't get it so far. And then we're going to... Can we turn up the volume over. on this microphone? Maybe like this, like closer? It's better? Okay. Sure. I'm going to give you another microphone like this. Sure. Yeah. However you like. Okay. The important thing is you need to be able to see the console log Hello World first. And then you need to be able to... Uh, follow that we, we created the add function that was a part of last week's lecture. Uh, one of the ways that we can create a, such a function is like uh, declaring a variable named add. It could be anything, but in this case, we're going to assign a function to it. And num1, num2 will take, uh, will be two parameters to that function. Fat arrow meant that it is a function. It's taking the arguments on the left-hand side and it's going to transform those arguments into the right-hand side. In this case, num1 plus num2. So for a moment, I would like to highlight something here. We said we started with const, but if you remember from last week's lecture, there were multiple ways of declaring variables. Do you remember how many ways that we could declare a variable? Three. Var, let, and cost. Thank you very much for the answer. That's perfect. So in this case, we're using const. Do you remember the difference between const and let? OK. Thank you very much. Uh, she said, for a const, we cannot change the value of the variable. And for let, we can change that value. And what about var? Var. V-A-R. If you remember, Armand told us that this was an old way of doing things. Before, before let and const, there was, it was the only way, but it created some problems of its own. If you'd like to discuss the details, I would love to talk about it after the lecture. This is not uh, today's, in today's scope, but let's focus on const and let for now. So I'm going to show you a nice check. When you type node and you press enter, you find yourself in an interactive mode. 
if you remember last week, Arman was using Google Chrome's developer console, and then he was like typing four plus three and pressing enter, and he was just going to see the results. This is exactly that on the, on the terminal way. Press node and then press enter, and you can type anything you like. I'm going to demonstrate something to you. For example, for a let um, a equals one, this is a variable that we declared. Can you, by the way, see my screen? Maybe I can just zoom one more in. Okay. So if I want to change this value, a equals two, it will allow me to do that. But on the other hand, if I declare the const b as one, and then if I want to change the b's value as like five, I'm going to see an error on the screen. It's going to say assignment to constant variable. This is really, really important. Default is the const. We should always, always use const first when we're declaring our variables. And the code will show you. If you need to change that variable, then you go back to the declaration and change it back to let. Do not ever start with let. Always assume that that variable will not change. And most of the time, it won't. This is really, really good practice for you. For, for the rest of the lecture, we're going to be always using const unless it's necessary. So when you're in this interactive mode, how do you quit that interactive mode? Either you type dot exit, press enter, or control C would work in all environments, I think. And now you'll find yourself back in, in this. So OK, then, um, for example, I would like to add um, two values together. Let's, let's try it using this add function. What do I type? So console log to print it, right? And add, and then here, let, let's say five and seven, and I save the file. How do I run this file now? Someone else? Yes, please. Node index. Node index.js, press enter. I see both hello world and 12 there. Now I would like to um, multiply this result. We haven't done multiplication. Let's try as a brain exercise. What, how, how can I add a, a multiply function into my code? Could you please raise your hand and tell me? Someone else, please. Yes? New function. Can you please help me? Well, how do I start? Const multiply. It takes also two inputs, right? num1, num2, and yes, num1. Times is the star, this asterisk character in JavaScript in all most of the programming languages, so num2. That's perfect. So let's try to multiply the result of the addition by 2. How do I do that? Yes, please. <laughs> I need help. OK. I want to multiply the previous result from the addition by two. How do I do that? Please don't be shy. Raise your hands. Yes, please. Okay. Either we need to store this somewhere and then use it. So let's do it. Let's do the const addition result equals add. That would probably work, right? And then to multiply it by two, const multiply result equals, what should I type? But first the function name, I guess. So multiply, the first argument would be addition result. Thank you. And the second argument would be two, right? So we would like to multiply it. And to see the result, console log multiply result. How do I run it? Node index.js, press enter, and I see 24, which is the correct number. But let's imagine that while writing this code, I made a mistake. Let's imagine that I forgot the 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 operator for multiplication, and I instead I pressed the minus sign, and it's just when I run this code, it gives me the wrong answer. I know that it's the wrong answer. To be able to, like, for, in this case, it's so easy to find that. 
uh, where I made the mistake. But imagine that you're working in a huge project where there are like hundreds of files, thousands of lines of code, and you, you're, you're trying to find that hay in the needle, needle stack. How do we do that? This is, this is the skill that I'm going to show you is one of the essential skills of a good, good programmer. It's called debugging. Have you ever heard the name, the, the term debugging before? Do you know where it comes from? Could you please raise your hands and tell me? Yes, please. Physical bugs, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the answer. That's actually very correct. And uh, the, the, the term is believed to be coined in the software engineering perspective is in 1940s. And uh, the an admiral in the US Navy, Grace Hopper, a woman engineer, were working in a room big computer. And then she realized that there's something wrong with the calculations. And then they literally went into the computer and they found a bug, a moth. And then she taped it on her notepad, uh, in, in her uh, notebook. And as you can see that there, it says, first actual case of bug being found. Hence, the name debugging comes from that. That term just ticked to, to, to the industry, and we use it uh, till the day, uh, this day even. And every, every IDE, every intelligent uh, development environment, integrated development environment will provide you some form of debugging your code. Today, we're going to learn that skill. That skill is. It, it is even the best software engineers don't do debugging properly. If you if you start learning debugging from the, the from the let go, you will be an amazing engineer. You will be the person that everyone will come to when they have problems. You will gain the respect of your fellow engineers. And like frankly, when we are writing code in our day to day work, like we write two three hours of code probably per day and the rest of the day spent is spent on debugging if you if you improve your debugging skills then you will you will improve your efficiency you will improve your your skills in this industry and you will be an amazing software engineer so please 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 uh, improve your debugging skills this is probably the, the first time that you're going to get introduced to this idea but please don't forget about it because it's a lot of engineers that i know forget about it they tend to go back to Printing stuff. For example, now I could just type console log everywhere. The console log addition result, console log multiplier result, console log there result. I could somehow print everything onto the screen and try to find out where it went wrong. But then after a few console logs, you forget which one was which. You had to prefix them with little things, and it's just so bad. But imagine if you had the power to actually stop the execution anywhere during the runtime when you're running the code and then look around what's happening at that moment in time and if everything is alright you continue you see, you check the, the the next step and oh when you find the result when you find the mistake you fix it and then you're done you don't have to print and console log everything onto the screen so today i'm going to show you how to do that in visual studio code um you can see that there's a when you hover onto the left hand side you can see a little um red circle that when you hover on uh, on it it's called a breakpoint it's where you want to break the code execution i would like to break the code execution on the first line for example and for me to be able to do that there is a debug menu up there if you can see that and then please click start debugging after you you put the breakdown uh, breakpoint there you will probably see this yellow arrow and if you cannot see it there is on the left hand side there is a no to bugs symbol like debugging symbol please click on it and then you will be able to see the on the bottom hand you're going to see a debug console on the upper hand you're going to see the uh, yellow arrow there did everyone manage to see that uh, yellow screen uh, yellow arrow that is really really important for today's lecture so please raise your hands and ask for help so that we can help you go into the debugging mode. And please, teaching assistance help. When I'm trying to go into debug mode, it asks me to Chrome or not, yes. Okay. I just click Chrome and 
create some files inside. Okay, let's see, launch Chrome again. Uh, this is an OGS launch program, probably. Save it. Is it able to save it? Add configuration? No, I don't want to add new. Did it work? Oh, there, launch program and done. Maybe this. I'm not app chess index chess let's click on it yes Perfect. here you go does anyone need help to go please. into the debugging mode raise your hands if you please need help. raise your hands <laughs> we have so many assistants we're so lucky we're so lucky really Two people run to the same cry for help. Raise your hands. Uh, we're going to come over. Hey, somebody over there, I guess. Right here. Where? All right. Um, I have a question. Does anybody feel lost until this point? Raise your hands if you feel lost. And it's totally fine. And we're going to um, help you as well. It is totally fine to be lost. This is really, really, really hard. It's no shame that you're lost. Please raise your hand so that we can help you. What the colors mean? Um, like the, the yellow one? Like the band here? This one over here? Ah, oh. yes, perfect, great. Yeah, um, I think the question is, why does some of the words look in different color? For example, const is blue, where add is yellow, and num is a different shade of blue. The reason for that is just my IDE, in this case Visual Studio Code, is trying to help me to increase the legibility, readability of the code for me. It, it doesn't matter for the computer, for the runtime, if, which color it is. It's actually it is not saved. It's just the IDE interprets it and tries to show it in nice colors. In this case, declarations, types of declarations is, uh, are like blue, navy blue, and the function names are yellow, and uh, parameter names are light blue. So it's just trying to help me read the code in a, in a quicker fashion. There's nothing special about it. So the, the colors don't actually matter. And they all change. On everybody's computers, there are different colors. On every IDE, there are different colors. Just the point just is by keeping color consistency, the IDE is trying to help us find our code in a much easier way. You know the blue ones, or whatever color it is, I don't use this color scheme. Uh, my const declarations are green, for example. Um, but I know that whenever I see that, that's a const declaration. It's just to help you out. Yes, I do see it. So um, the question is, I actually don't know what it means. I just see green there mm -hmm. um, or red. Like, I would know better if I knew what they meant. So um, again, we wrote this last time in Chrome, Google Chrome. We basically wrote the same things, and it was working. It's still the same here. That's still the same code that's working. The colors are just an addition. Um, you can actually. Remove the colors as well if you read it better that way, just to improve legibility. There's no meaning to them. It is. It is. Everything is. Everything you see here is JavaScript. Okay. Um, let's move on, and then we're gonna uh, come back to that topic afterwards. You still need help? Help. Coming over. Okay. I think the majority is um, up to speed. I'm going to continue slowly, but in any case that you feel lost, please please interrupt me and then uh, we can help you. So in this case, we, I was trying to find a mistake in my code, if you remember. I, I know where I did the mistake, but sometimes I don't know. And I'm trying to find that out. 
and debugging will help me do that. That yellow arrow means that we are we, we are at that exact moment in time. The rest of the code hasn't run yet. We are just at that line, and then we're going to try executing code one line per line by line. So in this case, we're in the beginning of everything. There is nothing displayed on the screen. And on the left hand hands, you can see something called variables, a pane that's called variables. It shows you all of the things that the JavaScript engine knows about your code at that moment in time. It, is, it shows you which variables are declared and what their values are. There are some interesting things, though. We don't have to go into detail. But in the case, for example, add, for example, multiply. Multiply is that they are all undefined for now because we haven't executed the code up to that moment yet. On the upper hand, you're going to see some icons. One of them is continue. If I press continue, it's going to stop in the next breakpoint. And in this case, we don't have any next breakpoint, so it will just finish the execution. The next one is the step over one. This is something that is really, really useful. Step over means that let's go to the next line. In this case, when I clicked step over, I saw hello world that is displayed on the terminal screen. That means that the first line has been executed, but the second line were still waiting there. So I press next, and now the addition function is defined on the left-hand side. You can see it. And one more step over. We can see the addition result uh, being defined. You can also hover on the addition result with your mouse, and you can see the number, the actual result in that moment in time. So up until this point, I know that 5 plus 7 means 14, and that's correct. So next one, multiply is defined. And next one, multiply result. It's done. Oh, OK, now this is wrong. I, I read the line. I know what that line supposed to do, and it is wrong. OK, and then after a careful consideration, I see that, OK, the multiply function itself is wrong. So I should just fix it. OK, I knew where I want to fix. I can just click Continue. The execution will stop. I'll go back and then change it into the correct one, right? And then save the file. And then I can do the same thing once more. I'm going to click this Start Debugging button. Or you can do the same thing, Debug menu, and then Start Debugging. I'm going to do the same thing. The execution stopped on the first line. Next line, next line, next line, next line, and here, I hover on multipliers and it's 24. I fixed a bug in my code. This is this is an essential skill. This is I, I can't I, I can't even highlight how important this is. Please just try try to understand the reasoning behind why it's so important. Being able to stop the execution any moment in time and then look around and then continue gives you so much power, so much freedom, and it's, gonna, it's going to put you one step ahead of everyone else in this field if they don't do proper debugging. So please try to improve the skill on your own. Uh, did anyone were able to uh, follow me up onto this point? Did you able to debug, find the mistake in your code and then fix it just like I did? Please raise your hands and ask for help if you couldn't. OK, um, I would love to explain. But before I go into explaining, I would really urge you, I would really recommend you to watch last week's lecture. Uh, Arman uh, went into very much detail into explaining this. So I'm going to try to explain it once more. But if you, if you feel lost, please, please make sure that you watch last week's video as well, where he explains how these uh, things come into place. So um, in this case, Variables, as the name suggests, are, are, are things that we define and then we can assign values to. So in this case, add is just a name that I gave it. It could be anything. It could be Matt, it could be Arman, but in the programming languages, in while we're writing code, we are writing code for ourselves. The machine cannot care less. It just You can just type A, type B, anything you want, and the machine would understand it. But the code is for us. In this case, we would like to be as explicit as possible. In this case, I want to have a function named add. I, I want a function that does addition. That's why I name it add, so that when I'm typing it, it makes sense to me. It is an add function. And also, in this case, num1 and num2, I should actually write number one and number two, even to be even more explicit. Num1 is a shortcut. 
I, I just typed it very fast. Ideally, you should type as long as you can. The machine will interpret it in, in its own way anyhow. It doesn't matter. You should be as expert as possible because code is for us, for no one else. And uh, the fat arrow, just to recap, it just denotes, it just defines a function. Functions are, just like in math, take an input and then return an output. It just does some operations in between, a logical operation. In this case, it's an addition operation. For that operation to succeed, you need two different elements. One of them is the number one, the other one is number two. Those are two parameters into the function. That's where we write it in, inside the parentheses before the fat arrow. And after the parameters are declared, there's the fat arrow that denotes the function. And on the right-hand side of the fat arrow, there is the operation itself, what it does logically. In this case, it adds two things together. Whatever is on the right-hand side of the fat arrow is returned as the result of that function. In this case, when we, uh, for, for being able to call functions, call means that we would like to execute you like to give the actual parameters and then want to get the actual result it's called the function execution and you just type the name of the function in this case add and open parentheses and inside the parentheses you just give the parameters one by one as declared in the initial declaration in this case num1 will be five num2 will be seven and the addition result will be what has been what will be returned in this case num1 plus num2 will be assigned to the addition result in this case does this make it a little bit more clearer on how the naming and just operations work if still you're confused please approach me in the break or after the lecture so that we can uh, we can clear that up for you okay then um debugging important please now I'm going to continue uh, with recapping from last week. If you remember uh, what we did last week, we had two classes, uh, namely person and meetup classes. Classes were structures that mimicked real life objects, real life interactions, real life entities. In this case, person was a person in the real life that had a name and an age, uh, and then that person could attend meetups. And the meetup class was uh, also had a name and also it had the list of attendees where it holds who attended that and we had some interactions between them we had a person could greet another person if you remember and also a person can attend another meetup it could just uh, attend to a meetup and that meetup will have that person as its attendees if you remember this so we're going to today we're going to put uh, on top of it and then we're going to do it on the node.js world so for us to be able to do that i would like you to go to the github repository and see the week one uh, folder there arman has posted all of his codes onto uh, github last week and please click on the index.js there maybe you already have it from last week you can just open the same file i'm going to copy the person class here I'm just going to select it and copy it. And then I'll go back to my Visual Studio code. I'm just going to delete everything that I wrote. I'm going to post it anyhow. I just pasted the person class. I also need the meetup class. I'm also going to take that meetup class. Just below it, I'm also going to paste it. So I'm just going to close this terminal. I now have a person class and a meetup class in my index.js and nothing else. I deleted everything else. And if you're keen-eyed, you're also going to see that this uses a function called print name, and Arman has declared it outside of the class, so I will need that as well. I'm going to copy the print name function as well, and then paste it. Now, recap, I have a person class, just copy and paste it. I have a meetup class copied and pasted, and I have a print name function that uh, Arman used in the print attendee names function here. Just for readability, Arman has explained it last week. It was a convenience reason that he used this declaration. We're going to change it into class person instead of person equals class. This is just, just reads better. And then the same thing here, I'm going to do the same thing for class meetup. Is it okay? So now we have two classes. 
let's remember what a class does. A class, again, mimics the, a real-life object. It has a special function called a constructor. That means that it, it gets the initial arguments, that when that object, when that class starts to exist, it needs some initial information. In this case, a person cannot exist without a name, without an age. In this case, constructor takes two parameters, name and age, and it saves it into a special thing called this. This denotes that anything that is owned by that class, it's just its own properties, this name. When we, when we instantiate, when we, uh, when we uh, create this new person, we're going to give it name and age. Let's do it right now. Uh, so, for example, Mert equals new person. And name is Mert and age is 30. How old are I? Or. If you remember, we were creating new classes like this. With the new keyword, new means that we're going to create a new instance of that structure, because the classes define only the structure. We wanted to create an actual instances of it. So new person means this. So Arman is a new person named Arman and age 35, right? And then what could we do? Mert could greet Arman, right? Will this work? Let's see. Terminal. And node index.js. Press enter. Hello, Arman. My name is Mert. So it worked. Hi. Hello. Hey. What? I'm a human being. I'm just responding to the welcome. Ah, okay. I'm just... <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> All right, then. So just. Same JavaScript, that's the beauty of it. The same code, line by character by character, the same exact code that we run on Google Chrome. Now we can run it in the Node.js environment. Exactly the same, I didn't change anything at all. So let's now create a new meetup, uh, WTMB. Let's say new meetup. And let's see what meetup required of me. Constructor takes a single argument, right? So it just needs a name from me. So the first argument is WTM Berlin. Let's keep it short. How does, how can Arman attend this meetup? What should I type to, yes, please. Arman dot attend WTMB. If you remember, attend was a function that was defined in the uh, person class. So I'm, it takes a parameter meetup. And in this case, we just, are made Arman attend WTMB, okay? And then maybe WTMB should print its attendees out. How can a meetup tell us about its attendees? You remember? I'm just gonna scroll a little bit up. There's again a special function called print attendee names. That's what Arman has created. It just takes all of the attendees inside that meetup and then prints their names for each of the attendees. If you have, uh, if you're struggling with what for each means and how does it take an argument, please uh, either come to, in, uh, come to me in the break or please watch last week's video. I don't want to go into that detail, but basically it, as the name suggests, it, it executes this print name function for each of the attendees in that meetup. So in this case, what do we do? WTMB dot Print attendee names, ID is intelligent enough, it just fills things out for me, suggest functions for me. I just saved it and then node.index, as you can see, we can see Arman as an attendee. I'm going to also add myself to that meetup and then run it once more and I'm going to see now two names there. This is the exact thing that we did last week, all right? So now we're going to put on top of it. We only have two classes here, person and meetup, right? But imagine you're working in a real environment and then you have hundreds of classes, thousands of lines of code, and this is just a single file, this is index.js. If I keep adding to this, machine again wouldn't care 
but for us it's super 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 hard to to read it through even now i have to scroll back to um, to, to to remind myself what i did before so we need to we need to make it more modular we need to make it more understandable more reusable for that we have a concept in node.js called modules modules are like plug and play elements that you can just take any of them combine them and then create a functionality out of them it's just like plug and play like lego blocks in this case we can imagine a person being a module by itself it knows what it does it knows how to create a person it knows what functions it has same thing for meetup but index doesn't need to know the intricate details of how those things are implemented it just needs to know how to call a person how to attend to a meetup it just needs to know the ex the the functions that it provides to us, but doesn't need to know the internal intricate details of everything. That's what we're going to try to do it. We're going to break our boundaries from a single file, a single index.js, and then we're going to try to have a multi-file project, if you may. In this case, I would like to start with the person. I would like to create a new file to hold that person definition. Here, the new file button. And I would like to name it person.js. It's a fit name, I guess, right? So person.js is an empty file for now. I'm just going to copy this class person, uh, class definition from the index. I'm actually going to cut it because I don't need it in the index anymore. And then I'm just going to paste it into the person.js. And then I saved it. What did I do? I had the person class in the index. It was a definition. I cut it and then pasted it into a completely new file named person.js could you follow me up until this point thank you if you need help please raise your hands we have so many assistants here we can help you okay now that i have the person.js that is a separate file if i run this code node.index.js will it work no why why not raise your hands please Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the answer is those two files don't know about each other. Yes, they exist as different things, but they have no idea about each other. So we need to somehow make one of them aware of the other. In this case, which one should be aware of the other one? Does the index need to know about person or does the person need to know about the index? Please raise your hands and tell me. Index. Index needs to know about the person because it is where we plug and play and gather everything together. That is our main code, if you may, right? How do we do that? Maybe you have some, like, not just experience in the past. Maybe you can help me doing that. Please raise your hands and tell me how the index can be aware of the person class. Not you, please. Anyone else? Yes, please. Okay, okay. We went one step ahead. Thank you very much for the answer. We need to use module export. That's perfectly correct. I'm, I'm going to get there. What else do we need to do? Uh, sorry, could here? We need to define a path. Okay, so that path should point to the person class. And what is the keyword that we, what to do with that path? Yes, please? Import, okay. Import is a good keyword. In the Node.js environment, we call it require. We require other things, like hence the name says. The index has a requirement to know about the, the, the person class. And in this case, we would like to require that. For us to be able to do that, we use, we're going to use literally the keyword require. And we would like to assign it to a person. If you remember, it was previously defined as person in, in the rest of the file. It is like uppercase person. Where is it when we're uh, creating new people this class we're just going to create a drop-in replacement so constant person equals require now we need to require that the new file that we created and for that all of the operating systems use something called paths file paths we need to point to that file it all obviously includes the file's name so in this case person.js but where is that person.js 
we need to tell it explicitly to the Node.js environment that it is in the same directory that I'm in. It could be anywhere else. We could point it anywhere. In this case, it's in the same directory. The same directory in all operating systems is denoted by a single dot. Dot means that you're in the current directory. And then there is the slash. Slash is just like a URL in Facebook slash profile. Like slash denotes the other parts of the path. In this case, dot is the directory, the current path. And slash person.js is something inside the current directory named person.js. So I saved the file. And then when I run it, will it work this time? No, why not this time? Yes, please. The person doesn't know about the index. Does it need to know about the index? Probably not. It's just, it's just a definition. It doesn't know how it's used. It just knows when someone needs to use it, it knows how to function. But it doesn't need to know about index. We need to export. That is the, the previous answer, one step ahead. Yes, we need to export the definition of that module. Why, why do we need to export? Because we may not want to want everything in the new file to be accessible to the outside world. We might need to hide some things. We need some control over what we need the other world, the outside world to be used. We might need, we, we may have a lot of functionalities, secret things inside, whatever, but we might just export one thing to the outside world and that outside world can only use that thing. It is called an export in Node.js world. If we don't export anything, all of the files, all of the modules will export an empty object. It's just an empty object. I didn't do anything. And if I just console lock this person, it will be just an empty object. But in this case, we would like the person class. We, we would like to, 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 to use that person class. So for that, the answer was, there's a special function called module.exports. It's just something that you know when you use it, not just. It's just something that you have to read about. Module.export. If you assign anything to module.export, it means that anyone else, if they require that file, then they will get this. Whatever is assigned to module export, it is what you get from require keyword. In this case, when we export the, we export the class person, in the index, yes, we require the person. So this person variable will be that class definition. Now will it work if I run it? A lot of head shaking. I think it will work. Let's see. It worked. Yay. So now we have, we have extended our boundaries. We now have two files. They work together and still function correctly. Let's do it the same thing for the meetup real quickly. What do I do? New file. The name is meetup. .js probably, right? And then what do I do? I go to index and select this thing, cut it, put it into meetup, all right? Pasted it. Now we have class meetup. What else do I add to this file? Module exports, right? Thank you. So here in the first line, module.exports equals class meetup. And what else do I need to do? Introduce it to index. How do I introduce it to index? How did I do that? Const meetup require the file name, right? Again, dot slash meetup dot JS. I don't have to type JS, by the way, for convenience. Everything is JS unless stated otherwise. So I'm just going to delete that JS. Three, three characters is three characters. Um, everything is that JS. If you can assume that everything is that JS, unless um, let's see if will will it will this work? Do you think? Just the same thing, right? So it just worked. Wow, amazing! We have three files now. They all work together. And then we, are, we wrote our first multi-file backend application in Node.js. Please give yourself an applause. This is not, not an easy thing to do. This is amazing. Thank you. We're going to take a 10-minute break now.
Okay, in case you didn't get that part, we have a break right now for about 10 minutes, maybe 15. Um, let's do it 15. We have food outside, we have beer in the fridge and other drinks as well, so make sure you're well supplied. The restrooms are across the corridor, and if you need help, we're going to help you throughout the break as well, so feel free to approach us. Dina didn't help. Okay. Hi. Hi. Are you well fed? Yes. Okay. Can I ask something? Of course, please. Uh, actually, my Visual Studio Code guide me because I'm using some extensions for JavaScript, mm -hmm. and uh, it says you can use require like this import person from like this and for ECMAScript six. Uh, not currently does not support that keyword. Mm -hmm. You need to have a something that we call a transpiler that converts that thing uh -huh. into a This for, on the front end side this would work. On the back end we need to use require. Okay. Also it's as uh, suggested the same thing in here as well. Same thing. It probably okay. thinks that you're writing front end code. Because ah, it's okay. JavaScript. No, okay. it just doesn't know. It's just you need to use the module. Okay, okay, cool. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. Uh, I just want to check uh, the code on index.js because I just pay attention. Here you go. Before. Thank you. I think three questions. Like Please. one uh, question was about the last script mm -hmm. uh, kind of homework. Okay. Mm -hmm. Since I had like lots of interactions within my classes, where often I had this like the reference when kind of object was referencing itself. Mm -hmm. like like a circular. Circular. Mm -hmm. Is it a good thing? No, definitely not. Obviously not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so basically, uh, it, and it's going to create some problems in the previous uh, in the following lectures because we're going to start saving them into files and databases even today we're going to save it to the file and it's going to create an error you yeah, should okay. find a way to store one information in one place not in both places so you can always get it from the other way around there's always a path to that information but not in both places. yeah okay yeah it's because i saw this mm -hmm. it's not good because yes. uh, We'll, we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail in the MongoDB lecture, I guess, but we're actually using actual databases. There, there will be a concept called the 
the IDs of the kibbutz. So everything that you say will have an ID, like a reference, and then we're going to save only the reference. Okay. That, that, that only that thing, not the whole object, but only the, its name, its address, like it's just thing into the thing. So then it will not create that circular dependence. Okay, right. Should I already try to eliminate it from my class with the circular dependency? Ideally, yes, I would okay. suggest so, because from today on you're going to have some problems okay. with it. There are workarounds, there are some libraries, some helpers that other people wrote for you to manage that complexity, but ideally it's, it's bad design, you shouldn't yeah. include yeah. things in it. And then, uh, now uh, questions about the project, uh, kind of, I've got quite an ambitious project because, okay, I'm, I'm, okay. Mm -hmm. I, that would be like uh, an online submission system because I like a tutor, I'm tutor at the University of Potsdam and I teach oh, kind of algorithms. Okay. And now, I, because we were so tired of uh, kind of like manually kind of checking the code, like running manually, that I said, okay, I want to create okay, like an wanna... sub online submission okay. system. Okay, wow. Uh, yeah. I think that's a perfect project. Yeah. And a lot of people are here, we're going to help you. And basically, what I was thinking about, we submit the code in Python, mm -hmm. and kind of, so the backend will be like in JavaScript. And then somehow I will need to check uh, the run Python files mm -hmm. to check them against our desired outputs. Mm -hmm. And it's possible. It is definitely possible. You can run Python code within JavaScript, not obviously not Node.js, but you can ask the operating system to run it for you and then return the result to you. So you can just do that. Or we can, there are many ways to do that. We, okay. can, we, can, we can definitely do that. Okay, right. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, also, uh, because kind of now I'm already like working with this project, I designed the system architecture because it will be like front end part, back end part, both for admins and users, like students. And uh, what do I do first? I kind of uh, develop back end first mm -hmm. and then put front end on top of it? Generally, that's what we do. Generally, you create the back end first because that is where you need to really think through. Mm -hmm. the the, the proper architecture on the back end is really important. Where you save the data, how is the data structure? Mm -hmm. Like after you create that back end in your head, um, the front end comes data. It's just a representation of that data. It doesn't have much logic in it. It can have some logic in it, but the actual thing is stored in the back end. So I would generally start from the back end. Okay, right. the back end. Yeah. But always keep the front end in mind. What would I need in the front end? Yeah. What should the back end provide to the front end? Yeah. But implementation should start with it. Okay, right, I see. And also kind of my supervisor, he was a bit skeptical that I'm gonna do one that thing, with, one thing. with JavaScript. This could also be in parallel. Like uh -huh. in, in our teams, we, we most of the time we start parallel. Uh -huh. okay. And we, it's something called mocking. You, 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 on the front end side, you assume that there's a back end, mm -hmm. but there's actually yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. You just exactly. mock it, you just, yeah. Imagine that it would return me this yeah, yeah. response, mm -hmm. and then you start working on it, and then you connect them together. You don't wait for the back end. Yeah, and another kind of question, like my supervisor was super skeptical about me taking JavaScript as a backend language. It generally, a lot of people are. The people are afraid because they don't think that JavaScript is a, as a, is a backend language, but we are trying to prove that it's not. And yeah, I've been working in this industry for a very long time, and. 10 years, maybe eight years has been spent only on Node.js, not 10 years, but at least eight years, only Node.js. And we've built a lot of enterprise-grade applications with Node.js. It just works. Mm -hmm. Just you need to know how to use it. Yeah, okay, right. And for yeah. this kind of Because it can go really bad. If you yeah. don't use it properly, it can really go really bad. There are some languages that you cannot make mistakes, you know, like very stable, stubborn languages like Java, C Sharp, like it's hard to, make mistakes but with JavaScript it's so versatile you can do everything anything and everything with it so it can go wrong but once you know how to write proper JavaScript it just enables it unlocks a huge world so it's really helpful. Right, I see. And for this kind of uh, application, for this kind of project, JavaScript would be actually not a bad choice. It would be actually my choice at the moment. Really. Okay. It's just it, it would be my choice because both front end, back end, you're gonna pick this, this, stick to the same language, you can reuse some code. It's it's going to be really good. Okay, right. Okay. Don't worry, it's, it's gonna be really good. Okay,
Hello. Shall we get back to the lecture? Was the break enough? Hi. Hello. Hi. How is it going? OK, not a lot of people left, so I think that's a good sign that you're still here, that you're still enjoying the class. Class, how do you feel? Good or bad? Is there anything we need to fix? Is there anything we need to help you with? Are you all set? Is it fast? Is it slow? It's a bit fast. It's the right speed. No. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so in the first first lecture here today we learned about files which we call modules and we're going to build on top of this idea this is the basis of programming in general using different modules and you learned the interaction between different classes in the first lecture in the first class last week it's very much similar with modules as well they depend on each other Modules export things other modules require and depend on and use and they also have interactions um, now One hard thing in computer science is designing these interactions between different classes another one is designing the Module structure what goes into what module what goes under what folder what directory and This is something that you're gonna learn in your careers that you're gonna expand on that you're gonna build on so um, if you don't get it right the first time, don't worry about it. It's all fine. Um, there is no best practice of coming up with the right module names, the right files, the right folder structure. There is no best practice. So um, you're all covered. And OK, let's, are you ready? I am. OK, let's go with the. The second part of the lecture which is really interesting because we're going to dive more into the world of node.js right deeper and deeper yeah. all right welcome back to the second part of the lecture as arman summarized we have we used the previous lectures codes to build a multi-file um, project but for now it's not an actual project if they're just files that interact with each other for it to be an actual project we need a structure we need something like a cover page that in many other languages and environments you would you would find uh, in the node.js world this is called packages we are going to create a package are we going to turn our project into a package itself but what does a package mean any module, any file can be a package on its own. But when you also bring them all together, they, 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 they can function as another thing. Like, you know, they could, they could uh, depend on each other and then create a functionality that uses those packages. This is actually the beauty of open source. You know, we don't, we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we try to do something. Probably, there's someone else that also thought about the same thing and then they might have written that code and then if they're kind people they might have published it even online you know for the community to be able to use it those are called open source packages and in the node.js world there's something called a node package manager npm this is something that we're going to delve into um, in the following minutes of the lecture. This is 
an environment. This is a community where people, one, once they, they, they think that they have created something meaningful, they have created something that other people could use, they tend to publish it. Publish as in they take their source code, they put a cover page on it, which we're going to go into detail a little bit in a few minutes, and then they push it to the cloud in quotes. In this case, NPM is an organization, they, they gather all of these packages, and then they have a search engine where you can just search for things, and then you can find new things, and then you can just use them. For example, I would like to, First of all, I would like to start by making my own project. Once I'm happy with my project, I would like to publish it. Once you're happy with your projects, when you're done with your homeworks, at the end of everything, even before everything, you would maybe find that project valuable and could be used by anyone else, so that you would like to publish it. For us, we use commands starting with npm. I, this is a very dangerous territory in some um, environments, especially in Windows. Sometimes we had problems with this. So if you have any problems uh, working with uh, npm commands that I'm going to type right now, please raise your hands and try to ask for help. Uh, normally, npm comes bundled with Node.js. When you install Node.js, you, you have the npm as well. They're just they, they just work together, they complement each other. But sometimes there is a problem with that. So please type npm and type enter and hope that you don't see an error. If you see an error in the terminal, when you type npm, node package manager, npm, and press enter, you expect to see a list of commands that you can run. Or even easier, npm-v will just show you the version. Maybe this is easier. Please make sure that you have npm, you have access to npm on your terminal. OK, as we said, index.js is just a file. Meetup is just a file. Person is just a file, but we would like to bundle them together with a cover page. For us, we will, we will, we're going to create our first backend project. Not file compilation but an actual project for that there is a easy enough command npm init init means initialize short for initialize when you npm init something it's going to start asking you a lot of questions first what is the package name this is the name of the, your package that you're going to publish you can change it afterwards but for now i'm just going to keep pressing enter the ver first version description entry point test command, git repository, we don't need to know all about this. Author, license, is this OK? Yes. When I press enter like 10 times, you're going to see something that pops up on the left hand of the screen, package.json. If you don't see it, please click on this refresh button. Sometimes it just doesn't pop up automatically. In my case, it didn't. So please refresh it, and you're going to see something called the package.json. So it's different from a JS file, it has a different extension. It's JSON, JSON or um, JavaScript object notation. This is the best way to describe JavaScript objects, as the name suggests, it's JavaScript object notation. So we're going to be using JSON extension files a lot in our projects starting from today. When you click on a, a JSON file, you're going to see that it is basically an object. It starts with a curly bracket and ends with another curly bracket and has a lot a lot of attributes with a lot of values you can just read them these are the these are the things that the the thing asked me to and i didn't fill any of them so ideally when before you publish something you would like to fill as much of them as possible before publishing to the world in this case i would like to highlight two things one of them is the license licenses are really 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 important when you think about open source one could easily fall into the trap of everything is can be used by everyone, even commercially and whatever. It's not the case. Licensing is really important, a legal problem. So before you release your code, you should attach a license to it. And of course, you can allow everyone to do anything with your code. There are licenses for that, but sometimes you don't want people to use your code for example, in commercial applications, you, you should be able, you should pick another license for that. I'm not going to go into details, but if you're interested, please research that. In this case, ISC, the default one, is a very, very permissive license. Another permissive license is the MIT, like the school name. 
we generally use this license for all of our open source projects. I suggest you to do so. But again, if you're interested, please also research that. So this is our packet JSON. Now we have a project. That's, that's what makes a project. This is a packet JSON. And it shows you what is the, the first thing that needs to be executed, the main file. It is, in this case, index. It's our, it's our main file. I, it's not a coincidence that I picked index.js for my first file. It is generally the standard. We pick index.js for our uh, initial file. And then now we have, we have a package. We could, now, we could now publish it to the internet. No one would use it, probably. But yeah, we could still do it. We talked about modules. We created our own modules. We had the person class as a module. We exported it. We had the meetup. We exported those were our own modules. But what if we want to use someone else's modules, right? Like someone else probably wrote something for us, and then we are lazy. No, not, not always lazy. You don't need to write the same code over and over again. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just you need to stand on the shoulder of giants that is the whole idea of open source you need to find out other code that people maybe you they, they they wrote it better than you it's it's really interesting and it's a really good practice to also read other people's code it's really really nice how sometimes people solve some issues that you've been having with and then they solve it in very intelligent ways it's really really nice environment so open source is really nice and for example in this case <clears throat> i would like i know that my terminal has some colors in it, like you can see, like it's blue. My week says blue, but everything that I printed until now is was just white. You know, it just didn't have any color in it. There were some exceptions when you console log objects; it just automatically turns it color. But I didn't do anything for it; it was just built in. What if I want to console log something in color? I would like to print something in color, but I don't know how to do it. Probably I can learn how to do it. I can go online, go Stack Overflow, like search how to print color codes onto console. Whatever. I could learn about it. That's definitely true. I could definitely implement it without depending on anyone else. That I can do. But what else I can do is that I could search for a package in the NPM, in the Node Package Manager community. Maybe someone else thought about the same thing and were nice enough, were kind enough to publish that package for us so that we can just get that package and use it. We don't have to know about the details. For that, we need to go to npmjs.com. This is the starting point of everything. There you could see a search bar called search packages, right? This is like a Google search engine. You just type keywords. And in your package.json, you can add keywords for SEO and whatever for if you want your packages to be found easily. In this case, I would like to color my console. So color console. First thing that comes to my mind. I pressed enter, and I already see that there are 538 packages that match this keyword. Maybe not all of them does what I want, but probably most of them do what I want. Color and console, probably they're the same thing. First thing, that there's a library called Chalk. It is very popular. On the right hand, you can see three words, popularity, quality, and maintainability, or maintenance, whatever. Um, I can see that this library is not so well maintained, but it's maintained, better maintained than the others, but it's very popular indeed. So it's in the first place. So let's just click on it. What does that do? Chalk. Terminal styling done right. Yes, that's exactly what I'm looking for. It says bold, dim, italic, underline, inverse. Wow, OK, it actually does what I want. So maybe I can, I can use it, right? So I just, wow, anything. This is something that caught my eye. Weekly downloads, 27 million weekly. OK, so I'm, I'm not crazy. I guess this is, this is something that is needed. Someone, thanks to this guy or girl, someone like we can, we can use terminal coloring. Someone else did it for us. And not only for us, 27 million people weekly download this library. That's great. So I just scroll down a little bit more. It says expressive API, highly performant, really nice. And ah, just tell me how to install it. NPM install chalk. Simple enough, right? I just copied it. Please don't copy the dollar sign in front of it. It just denotes a terminal. So I just went back to my project, OK? And then I just paste it, or you can just type it npm install chalk. 
npm for node package manager install install and chalk is the name of the package you can pick a name for your package when you're publishing it when i press enter something happened there and then i see a line that says edit seven packages from three contributors why i just wanted a single package just want one <laughs> why do you think so why does it say seven packages from three contributors while well, i just yes please dependencies yeah that's great so I wanted chalk as a dependency. I just wanted that single thing. But it turns out that that person who wrote chalk library also depended on other people for doing some things that we don't know now. But if we go into the code, we can understand. Maybe he, he also had something in mind, and he also searched for it. And then he found someone else that did it for him and then or her, and just take that as a dependency. And apparently, there's six more dependencies that he de uh, that, that person depended. Uh, one of them, the, the, from the seven packages, one of them is Chog, and six others are other packages. We can, I would like to highlight something. When I click on package.json in my project, if I scroll down, now I see a new property here. It, calls, it says dependencies. Now our project, this npn install command automatically created this, now our project has a dependency. It tells to the outside world that it depends on this. And you can also you see the name. And then you see the version number. Versioning is really important in open source because the packages have increasing version numbers, and there is a standard for that, so that you know what you need. Maybe, maybe tomorrow the person will release a new version of it, and if my code depended on its old version, if that person releases it is the same version, then my code will break. This is the this is really important in open source. This happened several times in the past where the dependencies, the versions didn't match or someone removed a package from NPM so that everyone else that depended on that code, all of the projects were broken. This is horrible. This is one danger of the open source environment. But if you are a considerate, a considerate person, you would always publish your new code as a new version. In this case, we tell the, the Node.js environment that we would like to have 2.4.2 version of the chalk, okay? And there's something else that should have popped up. I would click refresh, and it's there's a new folder called node underscore modules. It just popped up automatically. I didn't create it. When I click on it, I see several other folders, and it's not a, a coincidence that it, there are seven, of them, these are the dependencies. These are the dependencies that when I install Chalk, Chalk is one of them, but six other dependencies also came with Chalk. Let's see what Chalk is. I clicked on Chalk, and again, no coincidence, there is another package JSON in Chalk, because it is a package itself, right? There is another package JSON. You're going to see a lot of things that we didn't include in our thing. You could research it, but one important thing is that you're going to see that it has a lot of keywords. Where is it? Dependent. You can see that it has something called dependencies, and it turns out that it depends on three other libraries. So one plus three, four. Probably one of these libraries also depend on two other libraries. So this this is a chain. This is a tree of dependencies, and in a normal Normal isn't a really normal project. You would expect at least 1,000 dependencies in a, in a normal day. When you're working with project, you just, maybe you heard of it, Express. It's just one of the very popular libraries of Node.js. When you install it, there just comes hundreds of dependencies that comes with it because it's such a large project. This is the beauty of open source. You just depend on others. Other people will depend on you. This is really important. And one of the good things about open source is if you don't yeah, you just you started using a library, and then this is open source, just like in Node.js, there are sometimes boards deciding people, maintainers for those libraries, and they they decided to, to, to take a wrong direction with the project. Maybe you didn't like where they're going with the project. Maybe they are making it making the life hard for you. The beauty of open source projects is that you just you're entitled to fork that project. Forking is a fancy name for copying the project. And then you continue working on the forked path. You just have a branch of that project, and then you continue working on it. The history shows that there are many, many projects that started under someone else, 
and then they didn't agree, they had some disagreements and someone forked it, and then the fork became more popular, and the other one, even the original one, just died in, 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 on the way. This is really, really, this is something that happens every day in the open source world. Evolution, yeah, exactly, genetic selection. So, okay, um, back to our code. We installed chalk, but what's next? What to do with this chalk? We have it somewhere. Does anyone have any idea how we can make use of this chalk? Because, just a reminder, I told you everything is a module. All of the packages themselves are technically modules. So just like with what we did with person, meetup, we would like to use chalk. What, we did, what, what did we do with the others so that we can do it with chalk? Please raise your hands. Anyone else? Yes, please. I require it. Thank you. So same thing, right? Previously, we have required person and meetup files. In that case, we had to denote them with dot slash because they exist in our local uh, file system. I would like to also require chalk. I had to give it a name and require, right? And uh, will this work, chalk? No, because it's not there. I, I look at it and there is no chalk there. Would this work? Yes, because it is there. Yeah, I know that it's there, but it's just no need to do it because it's such a standard thing to require modules that you have installed through npm install. They made our life very easy, and then you just need to do this. Just chalk. You can do it anywhere you want. You can do it in any folder, any structure, in any file. If you just leave out the dot slash or any kind of prefix and just use the library's name, it would automatically search for it in the node modules directory. It is just a standard way of doing things. OK? OK, we required it. Now what? I want to color a console log. Like, for example, I would like to go up and here. This console.log, I had a hello world, something like this, right? And when I run this node index, I have the hello world, but it's in, in white. But I would like to color it. How do I do it? Export the chalk. The interesting thing is the chalk has already been exported for us. It has been published, and it is already there. We just don't know how to use it. We need chalk. Chalk.blue, yeah, that would be very intuitive. Actually, you're right, but it might not be blue. We don't know it yet. It could be something very complicated. That's why there is documentation. The nice people out there who published it and that quality, if you remember, that was the queue, the quality, that, does, that bar doesn't fill itself. If you provide good documentation, if you reply to other people, if you maintain it, that, that number that goes up. So in this case, we, ex we expect that if this is such a popular library, the author has written good documentation. So I'm just scrolling down. <laughs> the first thing, usage. Very clear, right? It says const chalk require chalk that we did already. We didn't use the lowercase. We didn't start lowercase. Doesn't matter, actually, because it's just a variable name. We had started using the uppercase ones. It's generally what we use for classes. I would like to keep the consistency. Whatever you do with code, just keep, be consistent. If you start with small case, it would be fine, but then do it for all of them. In this case, we started with uppercase. Just let's keep at it, OK? And what is the example? Chalk.blue, hello world. Wow. So here, chalk. Dot, oh, um, blue, parentheses, and another parentheses. So we are encapsulating it. Would this work? Thank you. By the way, if you are, maybe you can see it there, the IDE already warns me by dimming this, says that this is not used. It should have been used, so it is an indication. Uppercase, now it went back to undim. It's just normal color. So will this work now? Let's try. Hello world. Woo, it's actually blue. <laughs> That's amazing. What else can we do? We need to go back to code, right? Either we go, by the way, you can easily go to node modules. You can go into chalk, right? And then 
the package JSON will tell you what is the main file, if you remember. It is probably index.js. I'm just going to click on index.js, and you can start reading the file. I'm not going to do it now, but please do it for the libraries that you're interested in. Maybe you'll find something really interesting there. For now, I'm just going to read the documentation. I can do other things. OK, I could also add background and bold. Let's do this. You can you see, you see that there's dot blue, dot bg red, dot bold. This is called chaining in programming languages. You are chaining things uh, to each other. So normally, you would expect that dot blue would return the blue string, but the author was intelligent, smart enough to allow us to do this kind of operation. It also returns itself so that you can also continue adding new things on top of it. This is called chaining. And now we're going to, I just want to try this back, red background and blue. Sounds really interesting. And then I think here, blue, BG, red, bold. Yeah, red background, blue foreground, we wrote, hello world. Again, to recap, I could have done this by my own. I could have researched it. I could have found out. It's not magic, you know? Like, when you read the code, you'll see how that person did it. But why? Why? It's just, it took like a few minutes of my time, and now I have fully colored the terminal. OK, but I want to do this for, let's say, when the meetup wants to print its attendee names, it should print in, I don't know, green background. I would like the meetup to print its green background. How do I do it? I should still use chalk, right? Then what should I do? Can I just, here there's a console log. I could just type chalk here. That blue or BG green. Would this work? Yeah? Because we are using chalk, right? Oh, didn't. There is something wrong. Let's see what it does. Chalk is not defined. It's trying to tell me something. Require. This is really important. All of the requires belong to that file, that module only. If you'd like to use it somewhere else, you need to require it once more. And anywhere else, once more. This is just the way of things. There is no global require for things. So in this case, I would like to require it here, I guess, right? We tend to write the requires at, as the first line of the, uh, of the files because they are the first thing that you do. You start collecting your dependencies, and then you will start using them afterwards. And it just keeps them neat and tidy in the beginning of the file. So you can still use, you can still require things in the middle of the file, but then you will get confused when you want to learn what you required and what you did not. So if you put them all in the first part of the file, it's really nice. So in this case, again, chalk require chalk. And when we run it, we have green background, Arman and Mert. OK, one thing I need to remind you is that when we added the chalk dependency, we saw that there is a new property here called dependencies in our package.json, right? And in that package.json, we saw that there is the chalk dependency. And at the same time, it also created node modules for us. Okay? So these are a lot of files. But I haven't touched, I haven't changed anything in these node modules. So this basically, a, if you think about determinism, when you, if I just delete this node modules, I have deleted it. Would you expect the code to run? No, because we depend on it, right? There is an error. But we don't have to write them all again. We had the dependency previously. What we need to do now is, previously we had the type npm install choke. We don't need to install, we, we may have multiple dependencies. We might have 100 dependencies. It, we cannot just type npm install and each library name every time. We just need a quicker way to do it. And, not just uh, npm allows us to do it. It's called npm install by itself. 
without anything else, or for short, NPMI, for our convenience. When we press enter on this, it just goes into the package JSON, reads up all the dependencies, and then knows about the version, specific version numbers that we need, and then starts installing them. So that we are back to where we started. When I run it, it just runs. This is managing the dependencies. What I now want to remind you is that when you're submitting your homeworks, you're going to now, from now on, have dependencies on your, in, for your homeworks. Please only submit the package.json, obviously, with the code itself. But please do not submit node modules folder. It's just unnecessary. Anyone who is reviewing or who's trying to run your code can just type npm install and press enter, and then get all of the dependencies that you previously had, you originally had. We don't need you to submit those files. They're just sometimes thousands of files. It's just take space. Uh, you download it, bandwidth, etc. You don't. We don't need it. Just please remind, uh, remember to only submit the package.json. There is also another file called package-lock.json. I don't want to go into details. You can also submit that. It's also another text file that defines the exact version that we have installed. Maybe a little bit detail in the dependency section. You, you see the version number here. But there's also a little caret symbol here. Yeah, details are not important, but this tells us that if there is a new version, we are allowed to install it unless it breaks something in the open source world. The first number tells you that if that number changes, the whole world has changed. It has a whole new API. Other than that, all of the APIs, all of the functionalities should more or less stay the same, maybe improve over time. So this caret tells us that we can install a newer, small version. Package like that JSON means that I need to install that exact version, that exact one that was originally intended. So that makes sure that you, the code runs on my computer the same way as yours. This just locks the packages down. So you can also submit that package that uh, JSON, if you will. So let's recap what we did. Last week, we had started with Google Chrome. And in a scratch pad, we, have, we just write some bits and pieces of code, and just it run. And when you close the browser, it was gone, unless you saved it somewhere else. But we, we, we started understanding how JavaScript works. There were some classes that mimic the real life interactions. They had some interactions with each other. We, we had fun. Now, today, we went into the we switched size, because that was the front end side, if you remember. It was the client. Browsers are clients. We switch sides to the backend. We have installed Node.js in our computers, and then we have taken the same code and then modularized it. We, for the, to to for us to understand the complexity of the things better, we just split it apart. We we on, we have been introduced to the concept of modules. We now have different files that are modules that export things to the outside world. In in our case, they exported everything that they have. But in a few minutes, we're going to have another example that maybe we would like to hide some things. Maybe, maybe not. So we, we understood the concept of module.exports. And on the other hand, the things that depended on those modules needed to require them in turn, right? We learned the keyword of require so that we brought all of our bits and pieces together and then we run it. And on top of it, we added something that we wanted that we wanted to use someone else's library that we did. We are lazy to write the code for, and then we just searched for it. We learned about npm. We went online and then searched for the package. We found it. We installed it. We we learned how dependencies work, what node modules is, what package lock JSON is, how we require other people's code, and then how we when we don't understand how we how to use it, we 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 learned how to go to and see the documentation, read the documentation, understand about it. So all of this together, we have technically and practically created our first backend project. It's a project on its own. We have even used other people's code. So again, maybe please don't get bored of me, but please upload yourself. This is not the, something to be taken granted for. This is an amazing, amazing feat. Please. OK, now looking at the time, we have some more time. Now we're going to go into another subject. It's about saving things to files. It's going to be an introduction to databases. But 
Sorry, what is a database? I mean, we just talk about databases a lot. Can someone now raise their hands and tell me what is a database? Please raise your hand. <laughs> it's a place where you put your information. Very good. So that means what can be a database? Can, can you name me a database? Postgres. Postgres, Postgres, SQL. It's a, it's a software, it's a database. But yes, it is a proper database software, but we don't have to go that complicated. You said that it's a place where you put things. You don't have to think that much complicated. A library, for example, is an Excel file a database? An XLS file, yeah? It has rows, it has columns. It actually fits the jargon very, very well. Most of the SQL databases have that, columns, rows. It is a file, but it is a database indeed. So it is a place where we save, where we store things. But what good will it make if I just store things? I also need to be able to read them. I need to be able to load them back into the memory. Everything starts with the memory. What we write is in the memory. And then when we close the computer, shut down the terminal, it's just gone. It's just gone. We didn't save it anywhere. But we would like to save it somewhere. That could well be a PostgreSQL database. It could be a MongoDB database in our case. In, in, in two weeks, three weeks, I don't know. In a few weeks of time, we're going to uh, be working with a proper database, uh, a very JavaScript-friendly database called MongoDB. But before we go into that leap, we're going to start small. As Excel is a file, do you think a text file, just a TXT file, just a file can be a database? Can it be? Yeah, why not, right? Is this some place where you open, you write something, and then you close it, and it stays there. You restart your computer, it's still there, and then you can read, you can load that file. So it is basically a database, a very simple one, but still a database. So today we're going to try saving some things to a file, and then we will close our laptops, not now, but when we come, and then it's going to be there, and then next time you run your code, it will be there, and then you can read that file. So it is basically a database. We're going to store data. Okay, in our code, you know, index.js, if you remember, let me just close these. Every time I type node index.js, what happens? The, the node.js runtime starts, like, reads the file, takes it into memory, and then starts line by line, just like we did with debuggers. Please don't forget about debugging. Just tomorrow, like, take a note of yourself. Tomorrow, I'm going to remind myself of debugging. I'm going to research debugging. Debugging is important. So just like our debuggers do, line by line, the Node.js engine starts reading the code and starts executing it. And in our case, we, our code requires some structures, like classes, and then creates new persons with new keywords. With every run, with every node space index.js, I create the Mert object or Arman object or Meta object from scratch. It just looks the same. But it's not the same. It is just a new object with the same parameters. It's just a new person object, right? So for this, that's OK. But imagine that you're Facebook. You run a website, that's social network. And then there are, what are the entities there? There are like people, again, users. There are posts, right? And interactions are like likes, comments, those kind of interactions that you can. You can use this in one of your homeworks. It is, a, it is just like what we described, but much more, much more complex. Much, much more complex, but still the same, kind of. So do you think that Facebook, let's say that I have a post, a picture that was, has been liked by, I don't know, 100 people, 128 likes I have. Every time the Facebook server runs or when I go to the website, do you think that Facebook asks everyone else that you had liked my post, like, like it once more, because I need to create that, I need to populate that once more, you know? Like, it just, it doesn't new like or everything. It just doesn't do it every time that you go onto Facebook. It is more, it's intelligent, more intelligent than that. It just saves those likes somewhere. There is, in this case, a database. It knows how many people liked a post, and then it just stores it as information. 
in, in their case, in very complicated manner in proper database softwares. But you could easily imagine that it could be an Excel file that just lists all the likes that I have. Or it could just be a text file in a, in a format that you can define the format. It just can't say that Mert's post, and then there will be the people's names just on, on the side. And then you can just count them and then end up with the number of likes. You can just create your own data structures. So what we're going to do today is that. Uh, at the end of the day, I would like to delete all of the things that you see here. And I, I would like to have just one or two lines of code that I could read from something that I had saved before and still end up with the same meetup, same persons or something. I would like to save the data somewhere. Okay. And as we learned that separation of concerns is important, what that means is that every module need to do its own job and nothing else. So the person needs to know how to create a person, how to greet a person, but it doesn't know how to, I don't know, list the name of attendees of a meetup. It just doesn't care. It doesn't know about that. But on the other hand, meetup knows how to print its attendees, in it, but it doesn't know how to greet people. So there's just a separation of concerns there. Same thing here. We would like to save things somewhere. And that saving operation and loading operation is by itself a different concern for us. That's why we need a new module for it. Is that correct? A lot of head shaking. Yes, that is correct. So we need a new module that, let's name it database. Nice name. So I would like to have a database.js. What do I do? Please, someone who hasn't raised their hands before, just raise their hands and tell me how to create a new module in my project. Please don't be shy. You know the answer, yes. Um, new file, database.js, enter, perfect. What else? And export it. We don't know what to export yet, but yeah, that's basically it. So let's, let's start thinking, what, what should this module do? It should at least do two things, right? One of them is saving things, the other one is loading or reading things so it should they both need to have functions so I, i'm going to start by writing a function i don't know so first thing is probably a save function right and what should the phase save function do it should i think take a i don't know like it should take a data as an input like we should give it what we want to save right and then it should save it somewhere and in this case, what should I do? I think it's, this is better. Um, I'm not going to write a one-liner function. Uh, that's why I didn't use the fat arrow, because the like addition, multiplication, they just you could just fit it in a single line. It was just really easy. But when you want to do multiple things or you don't, you're not sure what to do, this function keyword is really, really handy. And then it needs to be followed by curly brackets that define that function. So in this function, I would like to save this data to somewhere. But before going to files, let's use something that we already know. Saving a meetup to my screen, what does it mean? How do I save a meetup onto my screen? Confusing, right? <laughs> I'm just talking about console logging. It was basically saving things onto my screen, right? So let's start with that. Console log data. We're going to change this, obviously. We want to actually save it into a file. And now we want to, we need to export this, right? So otherwise it wouldn't be accessible for the other outside world. So what we did previously was module.export, and then we had assigned the class to it before. Now we can just assign save to it, right? Then when I require this from the outside world, what I would get is the save function. Is that correct? Um, it is the function, just like I used add, I didn't use the capital for add. I use the capital letters only for classes, classes where they have constructor functions, where they have this, like they, they, they represent a real world. And this is just an operation. This is just a function. That's why I used lowercase. So I could easily do that. I could just export the save function to the outside world. But what if, not even what if, I'm going to do it, I will need a load function as well. 
if I had another function, and if I had already exported the save function, how will I export the load function? If I do this, like, would it work? No, it wouldn't work because it's an assignment. It's just going to override what was before, OK? So what we're going to do here is that this module that exports, as the name says, it just exports whatever you give it to it. Give it. So in this case, if I give it an object, it will return an object with something inside that saves. The save function will be inside the object. I could also have. I could add new things to it. This is just like the JSON objects that Armand was trying to tell. Before we ended up with classes, we were just we had just objects that had properties, name, age, other things. They were just objects. They could we could add new things to the object. It's just the object was keeping it together. And in this case, I would like to keep it together. I would like to have two functions. I'm just going to copy and then name it one of them load, one of them save. Doesn't matter the contents, you're going to change them anyhow. And then I export them, both of them at the same time within an object. So if I go back to index.js, how do I require this? Hands, please. Not you, not you. Anyone else? Please. You know the answer. I know that you do. Yes, please. Right. So here, const, let's call it database, require dot slash, thank you, database. So what I will get as a return value is an object with a save and a load method, I would say, right? So if I scroll down, I would like to save, in quotes for now, it just does console log, database dot, the ID is really intelligent, just tells me there's two functions in it. One of them is load, one of them is save. In this case, I would like to save something. What did the save take as a parameter? It wanted data, right? And only data. So the data is what I want to save. In this case, what's that? WTMB, for example, right? So if I run it, it just printed it, just as expected. This is not so exciting. Just, it just was the middle step. So now I would like to actually save it into a file. For that, I need to be able to write to a file. Is that correct? And do I know how to write to a file with the knowledge that I have? No. So probably there is a library for it, just like we did with Chalk. I could just go and search for library, file, save, whatever. But this, again, this is something that you know, you need to know, just like console.log. There is no way of not knowing console.log when you're working with Node.js. There are some things that comes bundled with Node.js. One of them is the file system module. There is a special module called FS, literally short for file system. It is included in all Node.js versions, in all editions. It is just there, and you don't need to install it. You don't need to npm install, you don't do anything. It. You just need to require it. You just need to require it. And in this case, first line is const FS require FS. Again, just like a node module, just like something that you have downloaded. And you could also guess that you cannot publish another module named FS because this is reserved. This is for Node.js only. And now that I have FS, so this FS probably has functions for us to write files, read files. Yeah, this is, again, something that you need to learn. You need to research. You need to go to Node.js's documentation. I don't know if I have it open here. I don't have it open here. You need to go to documentation and read upon it. This is just basic Node.js. This is something that you learn on the way, OK? And I know already that FS, by the way, you can also type FS and type dot. The ID is, will suggest you a lot of things. But you need to know your way around them. But 
maybe the names will help us. We are looking for something like write, writing to files, right? So we're going to see that there is a write file function. It just fits perfectly to our needs. But very confusing, there is another function called write file sync. There are two different functions. One of them is synchronous, the other one is asynchronous. This could be a confusing thing, but just because of that, we have a full lecture on this. The next week's lecture is asynchronous programming in JavaScript, and you're going to learn all about the asynchronous part. So for today, please bear with me. We're going to focus on the synchronous part. Synchronous means that it just executes it in line with other operations. You just do one thing and then the other thing and then the other thing. Synchronous file writing is when you execute this function, it will wait until you write that file and then move on to the next one. Whereas in the asynchronous programming, you're going to learn next week that you're going to tell the operating system to write it to the file whenever you want and then you keep on executing other things. This is really strong. It's a really strong feature of JavaScript and you're going to learn about it next week. So for today, we're going to focus on not big it stunts. <laughs> Sorry. File write sync. And then I open a parenthesis, and the IDE will tell me what function, what parameters does it accept. Okay. Don't want to bore you to details. I already know. It just needs a path. And then the second parameter is data. So the path is probably the file path that I want to save my data in. And as everything else, I will start with maybe dot slash or not, not even it's gonna store it wherever it is. Data.json. I would like to keep JSON file, um, the JSON extension for this, right? So I'm I want to write data.json. And if I leave it like this, it's going to let's see what happens. So I just I, I replaced the console log with fs write file thing and I just gave it a file name, okay? And if you remember, I had already called it like database save with w. TMB. Um, okay, so when I run it, node index, and I refresh it, a new file has popped up, data.json, and it has undefined in it. You could easily guess that it is undefined because we didn't provide it what to write. We just gave it the file name. So as the this ID was trying to tell me. The second path is important. It's not optional. The optional ones are with the question marks, but the data it doesn't have question marks, so it's a must. I have to give it a data, so data. I think this would work. So this function reads as file system, write file in a synchronous way to this file. Please put it, put the data inside, okay? So I run it. Oh, it has changed from undefined to another cryptic weird thing. It says parentheses object, another object, like just as if one was not enough. Why do you think this says so? Why do you think it didn't print? Because console log printed it out fine, but why doesn't the file saving work? Can you please raise your hand and tell me your guess? Yes, please. It doesn't understand our classes. Yeah, that's close like for for us to be able to write something that you need to know how to write it right so yes please what would a file want what kind of input what kind of structure does it need does it understand objects for example no. well, i cannot hear sorry parse oh we'll get there thank you what does a file want from us strings thank you strings if you remember from last week they are one primitive uh, type of javascript like numbers strings are things that have characters in it okay and files only for now only understand strings they don't understand what an object is they don't understand what a class is they don't understand what a function is they only understand string they want strings they save strings when they read when you read they'll reduce strings. They have no idea. So we need to convert this thing into a string then. We need to change it into something that is understandable by this FS file, right? And as you might have guessed, JSON is 
like the ob our objects are in JSON. And JSON is such a standard way of doing things in JavaScript. There is, again, a native library for us to be able to do these operations. It's, it starts with, where are we? So here, it starts with JSON, just like FS, just like console. This just exists on the system. You don't need to require it or whatever, OK? So JSON, uppercase, when you press dot, you're going to see two functions, parse, parse, and stringify. Which one would you choose here? Stringify, because we want to stringify things, OK? So I'm just going to stringify the data. And error. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Please don't get frustrated when you get errors. Sometimes they look like they're just big, weird things that you don't understand. But start from scratch. Start from the first one and, and try to read it. It says json.stringify. There's, there's an arrow there, so it means that the error is there when you are stringifying things. And the next thing is type error, converting circular structure to JSON. Still cryptic. Starting at object with constructor meetup, so it's something in meetup. Property attendees, object with constructor array. And then the next thing, object with constructor person. And then property meetup closes the circle. Hmm, interesting. So there's a meetup, there are attendees. Attendees is an array, it tells me. And inside the array, at index zero, there is a person. And the person also has a meetup property. And then you start all over again. So it just goes on forever. If you remember, Armand was uh, giving an example like dot attendees, zero dot name, dot something, dot meetup. Like you could go infinitely within each other. So it would just, you could create a circular structure. But this is a problem when you're saving this to a file. It will just create an infinite long file because it will just keep writing things into each other. So this circular structure is not good. This is generally bad design. There are ways of there are ways around that, but for now, we're just going to find that circular structure and we're going to break it. In this case, meetups have attendees, attendees have persons, persons have meetups, right? This one. This is the problematic part for me. We just saved the whole meetup, but we just need to know which meetup I attended. So I'm just going to put that name here, convert it into a string. So not the whole full meetup class, but just the name of it, just for today's ease. So this will just save the meetup's name as a meetup into the person, and this will break the circle structure. Could you follow me in this uh, example, the circular structure, how we broke it? If you're frustrated, please raise your hands, and maybe one of our TAs can explain it to you. I don't have so much time, so I'm going to continue, if that's OK. But what we did was basically we wanted to be able to save the file properly. And because of a meetup dependent on person and person dependent on meetup, we needed to break that cycle somewhere. And then we did it. So when I run this file, this code, database.json all. Now there is something that I understand and read, can read. It is, it looks like an object to me. It's in a single line. It's not like fancy with multiple lines and stuff. This is a string. This is indeed a string. It is just characters. What is it, string? It's just combination of characters. This, from the machine sense, this is curly bracket, quotes, double quotes, N, A, M, E, whatever. This is a string. You can just change it. You can type new things into it. This is just a text file, just a text file. But for us, it means something. It is our database. It's a simple database, very primitive one, but still a database. So what's next? We would like to read this. We would like to load this file. Is that correct? That's what we want, wanted to do. We would like to be able to save things and then what are we going to do with that? We're going to need to load it and then continue our operation. So back to the database. We already had created um, a function named load, right? It was just doing console log. Now, what should, what should this do? Let me just delete everything and then start from scratch. Let's start thinking. Load needs a file name, I guess, right? So it needs to know where to load the data from. 
But in this case, in the previous example, we hard coded the file name. Hard coding means that it is not changeable. Like it is in the code itself. We just put it into strings. It has to be data.json. In your own examples, in your own homeworks, you could make this configurable. You can add a new parameter to the save function. And as a parameter, you could just type the file name. This will be very handy, especially if you want to work with multiple Clusters. For example, we are only saving the meetup right now. But a very natural question could be, but if I want to save the person, what am I going to do? Am I going to overwrite the file? Like it's just going to get complicated. In databases, we have tables for this or collections for this. But this is too advanced. We are starting simple. So in this case, if our file is our database, then we can have multiple files. That would just be very natural, right? For the persons, we can have person.json. For the meetup, we can have meetup.json. And the save file, the save function could get a parameter. The first parameter could be the file name, right? And then this data.json would use the file name. Now it's all dynamic. There is nothing hard coded. And I would go back to the index. In the save function, this would used to get only a single parameter. Now it gets another parameter. In this case, what should it be? What are we saving? What is this object? Meetup, right? So it would be really nice. So if you just do meetup.json, this would, if I run this, refresh. Now I have a new JSON file, and it has the meetup. And if I want to save, for example, Mert as a person, what would I do now? But first, database.save and person.json, for example, right? And then as a parameter, the person's name, right? Like just Mert, for example. So when I run this, I'm going to see another file person.json that in, that contains the man so this is how you deal with multi, multi different kinds of data because if i use the data.json one save would create that and write the meetup inside and the next line would just override it with the person but in your homeworks in your exam in your projects you might need to work with multiple different kinds of data this is how you do it just you can just use a parameter as a file name so back to load um, so the function needs to get a file name, I guess, right? Because we're going to tell it what to read. It should read something. And then what's next? Unstringify. It would be so nice. But you remember, you, we had another thing for it. But even before that, what is the operation to read something from the operating system? We started with fs.write file sync. So it would be very natural if we had something called read file sync. It would match. Same thing, there's again read file without the sync. This is the asynchronous version. We're going to learn about it next week. Read file sync wants a path. So in this case, it is file name, right? And then it needs, this is something again you need to know. It, as it's a string file, we need to provide an encoding. Encodings are how the strings are representing the operating systems. Don't worry about it. Just for every, th every text file, just make sure that you add this as, as a second parameter. Just, just make sure that you read the file in strings. I'm going to show you what happens if I don't do this, just as an example. So we read this. What should I do with it now? I just read it. It's in memory and then? Hmm? Yes, but when I call this function, what does it return to me? Console log just prints it into the screen. I would like it to be inside the, the code itself. If you remember, we just did it with addition. Yes, please. We need to return it. Thank you very much. Functions that need to return, literally something, need to use the word keyword return. Whatever you use the return with, it just returns that value and then stops executing. So it's the final line of functions, generally. You just do your operations, and then you return 
something back. And in this case, we just return it, okay? So what should we do here to read the WT, WTMB file, the, the meetup file? Raise your hands and tell me, please. How can I read the meetup.json file? Yes, please. Database base dot load and parameter. The file name is what I give it. What, what is the file name? It could be either meetup.json or person.json, right? Because those are the files that I created. I would like to read them back. So in this case, I would like to read meetup.json, for example, right? Meetup.json. Any other parameter that I need to give? Let's see. Database load. It takes one parameter. Okay. okay. So yeah, this will read it, but then so what? Right. We need to assign it to something. How do we assign things to variables? Please raise your hands and tell me. Yes, please. Const and a name. In this case, loaded file, let's say, equals this one. And then to actually see what it has actually loaded, let's console log it. But mind you, I'm currently demonstrating something. I didn't put the UTF-8 as the second parameter. I was trying to show you what it means when you don't put it. And what do we see? Weird things. These are ASCII codes, technically, these are the binary representations of the string itself. Maybe not even ASCII codes because it has some lower value. So probably it's even not an ASCII code. It's just a weird thing that the, the machine understands. It doesn't know that it's a string. It just reads it 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, whatever, whatever. It just doesn't know what a string is. Because it does, maybe, maybe it's an image. Images don't have strings. In it. You know, maybe it's an image. We could have easily read an image, loaded the image out of the first. But in this case, we want to read a string. We know that it's a string. So the second parameter comes in handy. By, by giving this UTF-8, we tell the computer that when you read that ones and zeros, interpret it as a string that is encoded in UTF-8. UTF-8 is a character encoding, doesn't matter. In this case, when we load it, now we see it. But it's not like colorful and whatever. It's just, what is this? What, what, what is the, the type of this thing that I just read? It's a string, right? So when we want to, for example, previously we wanted to, yeah, this is a meetup, right? It has a name. It should have a name, right? Loaded file dot name should print WTM Berlin. You would expect so, right? What does it print? undefined. You would have expected it to print it, but it's not. Because it is a string. It is just a string of characters that happen to include curly brackets, that happen to include quotation marks, whatever. It's just a string. But we would like it, we would like the code to understand it as an object, as a JSON object. So what do we do now? Any suggestions how we can convert this string into a JSON? We can assign. JSON stringify. If I stringify a string, it would, it would work. But it would be just another string that has more quotes, quotes in it. Like it's just, it's going to be really weird. You can try it at your home. Um, so, JSON dot that was the parse and stringify. Stringify was for stringifying. Parse is to read a string and convert it into a JSON. So JSON dot parse supposedly takes a string as an input and expects it to be structured as an object. If I change one character here, remove this, 
it is still a string, but the JSON parse will throw an error because now it's not a string that it can understand. It only understands the, the object notations, the ones that you stringified, okay? So database, json.parse, we parse what has been returned by the read file thing, that makes sense, and then we return it once more to the outside world. And loaded file that name. What do we see? It means that it has been parsed as a proper object. Like if I remove this dot name, you would see the full object. Okay. And that means that if I dot that name, it is just a, a, it's it's an object. It's a proper object. It's not a string anymore. We, we, we are back to where we started. We created the objects, we saved them, and then we loaded them, and then we continued working on them. Okay. So the next thing that I'm going to do is, the final thing that I'm going to do today is to delete everything that I did before. Obviously, I'm going to post the codes afterwards, but just don't worry. I'm just going to delete this. I'm going to delete these. I'm going to delete all of this. I'm just going to delete everything. Everything. I'm just going to even delete the save operations because I know that I've already saved it. That's the beauty of databases. They're just there. I have once saved it, they're there unless I delete them. And then what do I do? I load them, meetup.json and console log. Three lines of code. I could even make it shorter by moving the console log. Let me do it. I deleted this one and then put a name. Could you follow me up until this point? I required the database. I'm just going to explain. I, I removed everything. What I'm trying to do is, let me try to understand, uh, have you understand. I'm trying to prove that databases are functional. We had, we had class definitions. We had created meetups. We had created persons. We had made them attend each other, whatever. And then we saved the meetup into a file. And then we read that file and then continued working on it. So by logic, if I delete everything before the load file, I could still be able to load the file from the file system because I had saved it before. This is what I'm trying to prove, the beauty of databases. Something else could save the file, and then you can just read it. In the Facebook example, when you log on to Facebook or see your homepage, you, you just read it. You just don't save it. Those are two different operations. And in, in a few weeks, when we do our web, uh, when we turn our computers into web servers, we will send data to each other, and we're going to write data into each other's databases, and someone else can read them out from our database. So we're going to interact with each other. That's what I'm trying to prove here. And here, I have deleted everything. You see only two lines of code that requires the database module because we need it because that module knows how to read and save files. That's what we have to do. And the second line is database.load meetup.json. It loads the file and itself, it JSON parses it even, it does it itself. And then we want to console look dot name. Maybe this is what confused you, this database.load. Let me just go back. This was like this, it, we were saving it to a, 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 a variable, and then we were accessing the dot name from that variable. This is the proper way to do this. I was just trying to show off by even uh, making it two line. So let's keep it like this. We save it to load file and then console load load file dot name. Do you, is anyone around you, inside of you, within you, think that this won't work? Because we have deleted everything. That's a scary question. Her heresy. <laughs> How many of you think that this will work? Please raise your hands. 90%, that's a really good number. <laughs> the rest is probably not sure. Let's see. Never trust code. It did work because the meetup.json already exists. One last thing, if I delete this, just deleted the meetup.json. If I run this, will it work? No, because now 
both the code is gone to save it, and this will only read it. And it just says an error. You can read it. No such file or directory. Very, very explicit message. OK, today I've run out of content. Um, OK. And I would like to take your questions after uh, we end the session, I guess. I'll be here for a while, and I would love to answer your questions. So maybe this is time to remind about the homework, Armand? Yes, what is the homework? Hmm? What is the homework? For what is people? the homework? Build Facebook. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. If you remember, we had the, our previous homework was to come up with some real life um, objects like classes that interact with each other. But you did it within a, within a single file, just like Armand did in his previous lectures, right? So, and you run them in Google Chrome and the console. Now we need to practice what we have learned today, and we need to create a Node.js project using npm in it. If you don't remember everything, please, this will be recorded, and this will be posted, and you will be able to go back and then uh, recap. Please create a new project, give it a name. It will have a package.json, and then it will have an index.js, obviously. But please take your classes that you have prepared before and then split them into modules. Create files for each of them, and then have your index.js load them, require them, and then make sure that it works as intended. And then please save them into a file using the operations that we learned today, using fs read file sync and write file sync. Your end result, your final homework will contain JSON, either a single one or multiple ones, however you like, but we would like to be able to read that JSON directly. It should be committed, it should be saved. You need to save your objects, your structures into files, just like we learned today. And ideally, please use at least one external library. Go to npmjs.com, think about something that would fit well within your project, something, and then find that library, read about its documentation, install it as a dependency, and then use it in your code. Just, it could be anything. It could be even such simple things like coloring things, but please do it. Is that correct, Armand? Yes, and there is one more thing. Please don't forget to delete this when you're submitting your homeworks. Don't submit node modules. We don't need it. Please make sure in your GitHub profiles, you won't have node modules. You will need it to run your code locally, but please don't submit them because they take a lot of hard disk space. Um, it's not good for the environment. <laughs> it's, Correct. It's not good for the environment. It's electricity. Yeah. All those bits downloading, modems working. Um, it's. Oh, wow, advanced. Yes. Um, so you can research ways to ignore files for Git. Um, there is a special way to do it with a file called .git ignore. And whatever you put there won't be uh, visible in Git. Uh, but you know, it's a little bit advanced. Look it up if you like. If not, just make sure you don't um, submit node, node modules. If you do, that's fine. Of course, that's not a problem. We're going to remind you to, to remove it. but. It's best if you just um, don't upload it in the first place. If okay. you have time, I would like to add one more thing. I think, how do you feel? Do we have like two minutes? Good question. OK, the question is, how do you save multiple people to the JSON? Is it what you're going to talk about? No, I was going to tell about Nodmon. It, would, it could be a really nice tool for them to maybe, maybe, maybe next time. Yes. Yeah, we're going to so do So back to next the week. question. How, um, yeah. Would you like to? <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, literally. Um, so the question is, how do we save multiple persons into a single file one of them could be not a good way but person one person two right but no please not do it we have learned about something in javascript that's called arrays right arrays 
like they 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 combine multiple things into a single structure the uh, square brackets notation if you remember like we had something like this const um, people equals mert comma arman this would create a single structure out of multiple different things but it is recommended to have the same kinds of objects in a single array you can obviously add meet up into an array but it would confuse things so please create a people array out of the persons that you create and then save this this curly bracket notation is a proper object everything is an object in javascript and json stringify will be able to stringify this one as well it doesn't have to be an object. This will be a proper thing to be saved. And when you load it back, when you JSON parse it, it will end up as an array. So this is a recommended way to do it. Does this answer your question? And if you want, you can, of course, use it in your homework as well. Again, all of this is recorded. We're going to share it in the next couple of days so we can watch them again, um, see how it works. And then let's chat over Slack. We really like the early submissions homework submissions. I hope you keep that rhythm. We need your homeworks as early as possible to give them multiple reviews. Um, if you obviously submit it in the last day or the day before, maybe we won't have time to look into it. We're a big team. I'm kind of literally writing to everybody um, to ask them to do reviews. So I hope you received good reviews um, for your first homeworks. There were some amazing homeworks. We were just like, this just works. This is great. This is everything we wanted. This is the best. There's nothing else that we can comment on to fix or to improve. And it came from some of the people who just started programming. And that is the power of, of this course. If you just follow the contents and do the homeworks, you're going to be there in eight weeks. You're going to be building your real life applications like a pro, basically. Um, yeah, that's or like a king. Um, or queen. Or queen. Um, all right. This is everything. We'll see you next week here at the same time. Uh, we're going to start at 7 p.m. again. Is if it you Thursday come... again, Arman? I Wait. think this time it changes. Next week, Thursday is Halloween. So next week, it's going to be on Wednesday. Um, because maybe some of us will go to Halloween parties. Who maybe. Knows? <laughs> It's definitely not personal decision. <laughs> um, so next week, we're going to be here on Wednesday. Make sure you follow Meetup and get the, the date correct. Um, have fun. Have a nice week and weekend. Thank you.
Oh, really? That's the real one. So in the circle is... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so in the circle. It's just very simple chat. So we have chat room. yourself to other to the things the most that maybe yeah maybe in this case in this case for so this the most pets need to have slow. Doesn't need to have the full book. It just needs to have the name or some kind of identifier. So I would hope that yes. So this wolfpets that push that book. I would just use what does it has a name. I would just use wolfpet that name. To just break that chain, not the full of chain, but just the name. So the slot is only aware of the name of the book, but the book, but not the full one. But the book that knows the full slot, so if you want to go through the book, you can get to all the slots. But the slot itself does not have the full one. So it's just the slot. Yeah, just after that. This might create another arena. But it is probably something else. But this is the idea. Like if, the idea is you shouldn't have full objects within each other. Wolfpack can have the full objects, but the slot cannot have the full object of the name. Only it needs to have the name. Maybe there's something else. You no, know, maybe another one has this. It depends. Try to understand what is what gets put into what. So drawing on the paper, it's just easy. Mm -hmm. And try to make sure that full objects are represented somewhere, but not the other way around. They shouldn't include each other. Okay? Yeah. Only just break it by just that name or something. Just make sure that they don't contain the full of it. Is, this is the only way that you can break it. <laughs> Please ask questions. Like, try to solve it on your own. This is where the challenge is. This is yeah. more important if you solve it yourself. If not, we are always here. Just pass yeah. your yeah. Line. It should tell you what is your Mine show. No, this is not the last one. This is 10. Uh, please download the 12 or the 13. It will have those two versions in a year. So if you install the newer one, maybe you'll have a better one. Mine is the latest version, it shows the full mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> It will help. No problem at all. Arman, pardon, do you know where did you get the name? Do you understand the name? Do you understand the Minimize it. Minimize? Yeah, it's out of the way. It's out of the way. Download. Yeah, download. Ben şimdi diğer şeye geçeyim de... 3.24 GB mantıklı bir şey mi? Mantıklı. Diğer ekrana geçeyim de şeyi meeting'i bitireyim. Şimdi... Ya. 
<laughs> of course. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, 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 Öyle mi? Teşekkür ederim. Şey, insan böyle şey yapıyor. Well, Vue.js will be faster to learn. React is more widely used in Berlin, so it's a little bit easier to find jobs for. Um, so, you know, it's it's very difficult to choose which one to learn. Um, okay. Then of course, definitely. Uno is also using Vue.js. So in this course, we're also going to teach Vue.js. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. That was actually very good. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, that really helps. No problem. Thank you. And I hope to see you next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>